They pull in pretty tight. Scoot up. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. You know, the Bible prophecy, or Bible says that in the last days, God will send a strong delusion. Matthew 24, Jesus speaking, said that there would be many deceptions. And in these days, we have to know the truth. We have to know which specifically Bible version is the correct one. Which one is the Word of God? Our topic tonight is New Age Bible Versions. Our speaker was a college professor for 10 years. She spent six years, about eight hours a day, researching the scriptures and collating the major Bible versions so that she could bring to you the most accurate version. Will you help me welcome Gail Ripplinger. today and you know the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice uh, Jesus said in John 17 thy word is truth now if the father of lies is in opposition to the truth uh, we know he is going to be in opposition to the Word of God and there are four specific things that we know about the Word of God number one we know that it's inspired uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Number two, we know that the word of God is pure. Um, Psalm 119 says, Thy word is very pure. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. So we know that it's very pure, and we know that the purity extends to every word. The third thing we know is that it's preserved. Not only did God inspire the scriptures, he preserved them. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7 says, um, the words of the Lord are pure words. Thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It says thou, meaning God, will preserve them, not man. So God has promised to preserve his word, and just as he preserves this earth and he preserves our very breath today, he has preserved his word. The last thing that we know about the word of God is that we're forbidden to alter it. The Bible says in Revelation that if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. We've often wondered why they have the plagues during the tribulation, and it's because people have added to the Word of God. And this evening I'll be talking to you about how they plan to add to the Word of God. But he also said, if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and out of the things which are written in this book. So those four things are very important. Now that last thing that I mentioned, that we're forbidden to take things away from the Word of God, I'd like to show you a page full of Bible verses. The Bible verses you're looking at here, 17 entire Bible verses, have been entirely omitted from the New International Version. And so if you were at a Bible study and someone said, let's turn to Matthew 17, 21, 
If you were using a new international version, you wouldn't have Matthew 17, 21. Um, if someone said, let's turn to John, 1 John 5, 7. Um, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That verse would not be in the New International Version. So these 15 verses are omitted. So immediately the warning light goes up that someone has taken away something from the Word of God. Now, um, the weapon that God uses is his Bible. Uh, the Bible said the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And I believe that um, the authorized King James Version from my research has proven to be the very Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, the weapons of our warfare are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, now, if the only offensive weapon that God gave us in the book of Ephesians that talks about the whole armor of God is the sword, right, which is the word of God. All of the other uh, armor and all that sort of thing is defensive. And can't you just imagine that if that sword is for the pulling down of strongholds, that Satan would not want his strongholds pulled down. So he has had a campaign since Genesis chapter 3 to pull down the strongholds. Now, Looking at um, the King James Version on the right and the NIV and the NASB versions on the left, you will see, for example, in Matthew 17, 21, the King James Bible says, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting, okay? Now, this kind would be a devil. That would be a stronghold that the Word of God could pull down. All right? Now, as we look in the NIV and the NASB and in most modern translations, that verse has been entirely omitted. Okay? Can you see where the scripture that said, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word is being fulfilled right before your very eyes? In other words, if prayer and fasting facilitate taking down, God's, taking down the devil's strongholds, the devil doesn't want us to know about that power, so he's not going to let us know that. It won't be in that Bible version. You will see 2 Corinthians 6, 5, fastings is omitted. 2 Corinthians 11, 27, fasting is omitted again. Mark 9, 29, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting, omitted again, the fasting part. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, the fasting is omitted again. Um, okay, if the sword is the word, and that is our weapon. You will see that the word is also omitted from the new versions. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 4. The King James Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. There's our sword. Okay. The new versions say man shall not live by bread alone. They have omitted the sword. So I imagine the devil is very, very happy that he has done this. Now, if we look back, Genesis chapter 3, we will see that Satan's first attack was on the Word of God. The very first question introduced to the Bible was by Satan, the serpent, and that question was, yea, hath God said? So his first point of attack is the Word of God, hath God said, but by prayer and fasting. Okay, his point of attack being the Word of God, his method was subtlety. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. So we know that his major attack is going to be number one on the word of God, and number two, it's going to be a subtle attack. Okay, and we can see this happening in these new Bible versions today. Now, um, I want to show you a, a discovery that's been made that's very, very recent, and I think it's rather exciting. Uh, there's a journal called the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. And there's another journal called Statistical Science. These are journals of mathematical statisticians. And were either you or I to look at one of these journals, we would probably tend to read them upside down because they're full of uh, very complex mathematical formulas that the average person wouldn't understand. But in order to have an article published in one of these journals, it must be juried. And this particular article that I'm going to be telling you about was called Equidistant Letter Sequence in the Book of Genesis. And Several Hebrew scholars took 
the book of Genesis. There, there's the magazine that it's in if you need to write down the name of the uh, dates. But they took the book of Genesis and using a computer, they discovered equidistant letter sequences. They found embedded in the text of the Hebrew Bible the names of people, number one, now, not people that like Moses and that sort of thing, but people who lived in the 1900s. It included not only their names, but the day they were born, the day they died, and the cities they were born and died in. Now, these were in the Hebrew text, not you know, written straight out, but they were equidistant letter sequences. In other words, like every third letter would spell their name, or every fourth letter, or something like this. It could be across, down, diagonally, and only a computer could could pull all of this information out. The men that they found, the names of the people that they found, were people that lived in the 5th century, 6th century, 10th century, 19th century. Now the Bible says in the book of Revelations, this book, the book of life. And I, I wondered after I saw this article, I wondered if when people are removing these things, if in fact they are removing their own names from the book of life, because he said if you will take from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take your part out of the book of life. And so it may be that our names are written in the Bible. And the day we're born, the day we die, and the city we're born and died in. And he, it, it could be the very Lamb's book of life itself. You know, The Bible says that Jehoiakim in the Old Testament begat Jaconias. And that's an obscure kind of fact that most people don't know. But when you read the book of Matthew, it said Josiah begat Jaconias, and that would appear to be a contradiction. But what God did is he took Jehoiakim's name out of the Bible because Jehoiakim in, in Jeremiah chapter 36 cut the prophecy of Jeremiah. He destroyed it. And so God took his name out of the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. So uh, God will do what he says he will do. Now, two Harvard and two Yale mathematicians took this statistical science article and evaluated it. And they said the chances of this happening are one in 50 quadrillion. And these two unsaved, or four unsaved scholars said, quote, the phenomena cannot be attributed to anything within the known physical universe. They were astonished. And um, I think it's very exciting to know that we have the very words of God. He said, the words that I've spoken unto you, the same will judge you in the last day. And if God's going to judge us by those very words, he must give us each and every single word. Now there's an interesting sidelight to what's happened here in this research in statistical science. And that is the Hebrew text that they used here is the Hebrew text called the ben Hakim or Rabbinic Bible that underlies the King James Version. All right. They tried the same mathematical analysis with the Samaritan Pentateuch and it didn't work. Um, it does not work with the manuscripts underlying the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, the Living Bible, Good News for Modern Man, Contemporary English Version. It doesn't work with that Hebrew text. That is a different Hebrew text. It's called the Stuttgart edition. And it's a corrupt edition that was created around the turn of the century by a gentleman named Rudolf Kittel. Now, Rudolf Kittel, when you look his name up in the um, uh, Jewish Encyclopedia, you will find that he is, number one, anti-Semitic, and number two, has contributions in his writings from the Hellenistic mystery religions. And so for those people who knew him at that time, um, he, he appeared to be an anti-Semitic person in his writings, and so the Jewish people have never accepted his Hebrew translation. However, when you go into a Christian bookstore today, what you will find is that Hebrew text underlying the NIV and the NASB and these modern translations, and that's very much in part why they are so different. But I can't imagine God using an anti-Semitic person. As a matter of fact, Rudolf Kittel's son Gerhard um, was tried and convicted of war crimes uh, in the slaughter of uh, the Jewish people, he was Hitler's high priest, and he created slanderous propaganda against the Jewish people. So his whole family had been anti-Semitic. And fortunately, the King James Bible does not use that Hebrew text. Okay, now part of the reason 
I wrote um, the book New Age Bible Versions. This is the book I wrote. And I spent six years collating the modern translations of the Bible. Uh, years ago, I was not a staunch King James believer. As a matter of fact, when I would write letters to my mother, I would change the Bible anytime I wanted to. I really did, wasn't educated about the subject, and I was a young Christian. And, but I found that the young ladies who would come into my office at the university, I was a professor and they knew I was a Christian, and when they had emotional problems, they would come into my office and cry, and I would show them a verse in the Bible or something to help them feel better. And I noticed that those who were using the modern translation seemed to be unstable, emotionally depressed, anxious, all those sorts of things. And it made me stop to think perhaps that's why psychology has moved into the church because of some of the problems these versions have caused. But as I was collating those translations, um, impeded by my love for these young people at the university who seemed to be having problems, and I really wasn't quite sure that it was coming from these versions, but I, I saw that there was a problem. Um, I looked in Matthew chapter 4, 18, for Jesus uh, came to heal the brokenhearted, and that verse is completely omitted in the new versions. Uh, looked at something simple like be of good comfort in Luke chapter 8, entirely omitted. Um, the mercy of God, entirely omitted. As a matter of fact, the mercy seat, which is 53 times in the Old Testament, has been entirely omitted in the NIV. No more mercy seat in the NIV. So it's sort of some kind of a lid now. I don't know what kind of a lid it is. But, um, Mark chapter 3, power to heal the sick, completely omitted. Acts chapter 3, the lame man was healed, completely omitted in the NIV. Okay, now they've created a caricature of God, I found, in the new versions. For instance, when we've got Ephesians, Jesus nurturing his church. Nurturing comes from the word nurse, as a mother would nurse her children, holding them lovingly, okay? Or humble, 1 Corinthians 12, God nurtures us and he humbles us, okay? In the new versions, it says discipline and humiliate. Now, can you imagine, imagine wanting to go to a God who was going to discipline and humiliate you? I can't imagine either, and now I see why those young ladies that I suggested go home and read their Bible would come back and they would be more depressed than they were when they left. Um, now we're going to be looking at some of the omissions in new versions and what you will find as we go through these omissions is that the omissions in the new versions serve to make the Bible accommodate other religions. Now, if you were a marketer, you would know that that would increase your market share. If you can include other religions, then you can sell more Bibles. If you can include every denomination, not just born-again Christians, but the liberal, you know, seminaries and the liberal churches, if you can include everyone, obviously you can sell more Bibles. This is what's happened. Now, the main tenet of the New World religion is tolerance for the religious beliefs of others, all right? Um, so you could say the New World religion is inclusive. It includes everyone. As a matter of fact, it will even include Christians if you want to join, all right? Now, Christianity is exclusive. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, all right? What you will see in these new versions is that they allow a broader kind of a definition. Now, looking up um, at these samples I've shown you here, a simple verse to teach a child is uh, 1 John 4, 14. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Okay, all one-syllable words. But we have one Father, the Father, one Son, one Savior, and one world. Okay? Now, when we look in the new versions, NIV and NASB, you will see that they have a God, one of many, who sends a son or avatar um, with a message to each age. And so with the new versions, you will see a gospel, a message, a God, a son, a Savior, and an age, rather than the God, the Son, the Savior, and the world. One way or many ways, okay? Now, um, one question you might ask your friends or ask yourself is, do I have a holy Bible? Now, this is a cover of a New International Version, okay? And um, after collating it, I really didn't feel that I wanted to keep the rest of it, so, but I did keep the cover. Um, but it says, Holy Bible on the cover. So let's do a little investigation and see if it, in fact, is a Holy Bible and if this is truth in advertising. Okay. Now, remember there was just one ark, okay? There's just one Savior, one God, and there's also just one Bible, as you'll come to see. Now, notice the King James 
It says, holy men. Now that comes from Peter where it says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the scriptures came from holy men. When we look at the NIV, it just says men. At least they're honest and they admit that they weren't holy men that wrote it. Uh, when we look at Matthew 25, we have the holy angels. Now, we know in 2 Peter there are angels that sinned. We know the angels, there are angels that left their first estate. Revelation talks about the devil and his angels. So all angels are not holy angels. And so we must distinguish the holy angels from the unholy angels. But I'm, I'm afraid the new versions don't do that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about the holy brethren. Okay, now, unfortunately, in Timothy, it says, in the last days, men shall be unholy. Well, no wonder they're unholy, because it doesn't say holy in front of brethren in their Bible, I'm afraid. Revelation 22, 6, we have the holy prophets. Uh, First Peter, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1 says there were false prophets among the people. So we must distinguish between holy prophets and false prophets. Now, finally, we know God is holy. Okay, we read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we know the Bible is referred to in Romans and, and 2 Timothy as the Holy Scriptures. And so if God is holy, we can see his name there, Holy Ghost, several times. When we look at the new versions, it's simply spirit. Okay, Holy has been not completely removed from the new versions, but um, very often it's being removed from the new versions. Okay, Now, that last... Um, thing that we looked at, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Just recently, in the 50s and 60s, the oldest papyra in the world, attesting to the reading in John chapter 7, verse 38 through 45, that talks about the Holy Ghost, was discovered. It's called P66. Okay, they're carbon dating this, or dating this, I should say, rather, uh, about 180 AD. So this is the very oldest copy of this portion of John that exists on earth. All right. Now this was recently discovered. So those gentlemen who went to seminary or whose professors went to seminary before this collation came out would not be uh, you know, aware of this information. I'm afraid that many of the seminary professors and their students are simply behind the times with the collation of the papyra. But I want you to notice something here. The word um, spirit is the underlined word here. Or not underlined, excuse me, there's a line above it. Okay, they always put a line above the names of deity in these old manuscripts. But above the word holy, you will see some little dashes. Those dashes are called obelisks. The obelisk was what, was what is called a critical mark from the Alexandrian school. Now this papyra was found near Alexandria, Egypt. And that, those little dashes meant omit this. In other words, on the face, the original face of the oldest manuscript in the world attesting to this verse, it said Holy Spirit. And whoever was writing over this, or whoever was editing this, wanted to omit the word holy. So we can see that the King James Version, Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, is the original reading. And they wanted to omit the word holy, looking at those dashes above there. Okay. I would be surprised if the average seminary professor knows about that information. Okay. We're going to be looking at some tests for Antichrist. We're going to sort of put the Bible under, under a microscope just a little bit, and it's going to tell us what the true Bible is and what the false Bible is. It will give us the criteria. And the first test for Antichrist, or who's telling the truth or who's lying, uh, is given in 1 John chapter 2. It says, who is a liar? But he that denies that, that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist. Okay, so those who do not say Jesus is Christ are anti-Christ. We will look at John chapter 4. The King James says, is not this the Christ? If I said to you, is, isn't that your wife? I'm expecting a positive response, okay? The NIV says, this is not the Christ, is it? And if I said to you, that's not your wife, is it? You're expecting a negative response, okay? Then you will see that the word Christ is omitted from Jesus' name. Thou art that Christ omitted in the Living Bible. When we see the name Jesus, they're taking Christ away from his name. Now, uh, if you look in the Mexican phone book or the Texas phone book, you'll find lots of gentlemen named Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That's a very special name. But putting Christ on the end indicated that he was the anointed Messiah. 
all right? And if you just said his name was Jesus, you weren't saying as much as when you said he was the Christ. Um, the King James says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The New Version says, I can do all things through him. Who is the him? Okay, it's a generic Bible. The Buddhists could fill that in for themselves. And so we've just sold 10,000 more Bibles if we can sell them to the Buddhists. Romans 1, chapter 16, the gospel of Christ. We are warned about another gospel. If anybody come and preach another gospel, how do we distinguish our gospel from another gospel? We distinguish it because ours is the gospel of Christ. Okay, theirs is just another gospel. You will find that in the NIV and the NASB. Now, I have these two letters, et al, after most of these charts up here. Et al is simply Latin, and it means and others. Okay, this is not inclusive. It doesn't mean that every Bible version in the world omits these. But you will find, as a general rule, that this is what all Bible versions say other than the King James Bible, for the most part. Even when they do say, Lord Jesus, um, many shall come and, and say, I called you Lord, okay? But they've taken off Christ from his name. Can everyone see that? Is that all? Okay. So I'm afraid they've, they've lost off first, on first base. Test one. Test two for Antichrist is he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. All right. Now the Muslims will say, uh, I re recall a Muslim gentleman coming up to me at Kent State University and he, I'd given him a Bible. I used to distribute Bibles there. I gave him a Bible and he threw it back at me and he said, you know, don't tell me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God can't have a son. And um, the, our Bible says that he did. But he's Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And so when you look in the New Versions, where it says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? John chapter 9, the New Versions simply say, Do you believe on the Son of Man? Okay. So he's not the Son of God anymore. Um, very important verse, Acts 8, 37. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay. That entire verse is omitted in all of the New Versions, for the most part. Okay. The King James says that we are an heir of God through Christ, okay, and only through Christ. The new versions omit through Christ. Now, they've got God, but they don't have the Son. Can you see they don't have the two together? God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Okay. That's an exclusively Christian notion that God created all things by Jesus Christ. Um, a, a Muslim or a Hindu would believe that God created all things but they would not believe it was by Jesus Christ. And so we will see by Jesus Christ omitted in the new versions. Um, I could show you tons and tons more places, and I won't bore you showing you a million verses like that. But you can see, do you remember when the devil said to Jesus, when he took him up on the mountain, and he tempted him, and he said, if thou be the Son of God? There was a question mark. Was he the Son of God? Now, when you read... Um, um, the book of uh, Romans, I believe it is. And you're looking for Jesus Christ. You will find that he's missing in very many places in that book. Okay, then the third test for Antichrist is, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? King James says, every spirit that confesses not, confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, 1 John 4, 3. Okay, those very words, Christ is come in the flesh. Okay. They've been completely omitted in the NIV, in the NASB, in all the new versions. In other words, the criteria for being antichrist, the criteria for being a deceiver, the very words, Christ is come in the flesh, are taken out. So the verses on their very face attest to the fact that they are antichrist. Okay? Now, when we look in the book of Acts, in the first and second and third chapters, you will see that we are building up to the declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When you get to the third chapter, Jesus is the Son of God, all right? When you look at the New King James Version, you will see that they have taken the word son away, and they call him merely a servant. And it's interesting, if you follow that Greek word through the Bible, there are other places where that very Greek word is used, and the New King James and the New Translations all translate it son, but they wouldn't give Jesus Christ credit for being the son there. 
Um, the New King James does some other very interesting things I found when I was collating it. Whenever they make a change from the King James Bible, they follow the New World Translation of the Jehovah Witnesses. An example would be um, John 14 and all the other places where the Holy Ghost is called the Comforter. Now, a Comforter is superior to me. If someone can comfort me, I must be subordinate and they must be superior, right? Okay, and God is always superior, right? Now, in the New King James, they have adopted the Jehovah Witness rendering of the Helper. That's always been what the Jehovah Witness sect has called the Holy Spirit because they believe that the Holy Spirit was subordinate to man. He was not a part of the Trinity. He was me merely a helper. And so it's sad to see that the New King James has um, moved on to that mode of thinking. Okay, now in Christianity, our, our uh, faith is unique in that we have a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Uh, in John 16, he prophesied ahead and he says, because I go to the Father. In other words, he prophesied that he was going to ascend uh, and be with his Father. That very last phrase is omitted in all the new versions. And you will see as you follow through some of these examples on this page that every chance they get when they're talking about the resurrection or the ascension, they either omit it or they question it in a footnote. For instance, in Luke 24, uh, verse 51, one of the most important verses in the Bible, it says, Jesus was parted from them, carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him. Okay, so we have him going up, and we have the people down there worshipping him. In other words, he must have been God, because the uh, commandment says, you know, worship God only. Okay, in the new versions, it merely says he parted from them. You know, we have the Mormon theology that he went to America, took a boat. Uh, we have the New Age philosophy that says he went to the Himalaya Mountains and he's been staying there for the last 2,000 years and will come out as Maitreya the Christ. So the New American Standard Bible, which is this is a sample of, agrees exactly. As a matter of fact, I have some quotations from some of the New Agers where they're quoting this and they will point to this and they will say, see, he didn't go up to heaven, he went to the Himalaya Mountains. But we know they worshiped him because he was God and he went up to heaven. Um, another example would be Ephesians 5. Uh, now that he has ascended up to heaven, the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. That is the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He said to Thomas, you know, spirit hath not flesh and bones like this. Feel me. Okay? The new versions merely say we are members of his body. They omit flesh and bones because many of the New Version translators do not believe in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the people who created the Greek text underlying this do not either. So. Okay, I'll give you a brief summary of what we've looked at here, um, what we're going to be looking at. The King James Version says, Jesus, thou Son of God, Jesus. The New Version say, you, Son of God, or He, dropping the name Jesus. Every time we see a usage referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, the new versions will always make it smaller or demote the Lord Jesus Christ in one degree. If it does say Jesus Christ, they'll drop it to Christ. Or the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll drop it to the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus. It's always one step down. Okay. Now, I'll give you something a little technical, but it's kind of interesting. I think um, it'll kind of jog your mind. Um, the Antichrist, as we know, may take the name of Christ. And let me tell you why I think that that may happen. Revelation 13 talks about the beast. And it says he has the names, or excuse me, the name of blasphemy. Now Webster's defines blasphemy as taking on the attributes of God, not just demoting God or blaspheming God, but actually taking on the attributes of God oneself, okay? Now, um, the Bible says that the name of the beast or the number of his name, but I'm going to show you something in the Bible that will give you a tip that the number of the beast and the name of the beast may be merged together. Now watch this. The Greek text underlying the King James Bible um, that was originally written is called a Textus Receptus. Okay? And we have about 5,200 manuscripts extant today, and 99% of those agree with the King James Bible. That's why it's called the Textus Receptus. It just simply means the text received by all. It's the Greek text that has been used in the church 
throughout the 2,000 years since Jesus Christ has been here. And when we read um, Revelation where it says, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Okay, now the Textus Receptus has three letters representing 603 score and six in the Greek text, okay? Now, this represents 600, this represents 60, and this represents six. In the Greek language, they had a system wherein Greek letters represented numbers, okay, very much like Latin numerals, all right. Now, when we look at the very first letter, um, the first letter is abbreviation for Christ in Greek. You will see that very often in Roman Catholic churches where they have like a P with an X through it, okay. The second letter uh, would be, uh, would symbolize Christ for the Latin speaking people because X is the 21st letter of the Latin al alphabet and represents the phonetic value of KS. So to Latin speaking people, that sound would represent Christ, okay? And then when we look at the sigma, which is this letter right here, it corresponds to the Hebrew samak, which is the 15th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that most nearly expresses X. So what you have here in the three languages that we have on the cross, uh, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, you have X, 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 or Christ, 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 okay? And so this is not the true Christ, this is a false Christ. Now in Luke chapter 2 it says he had seen the Lord's Christ, saying that there is a counterfeit, there is a false Christ. Revelation 11 said our Lord and his Christ. In other words, there is a true Christ and there is an antichrist, there is a false Christ. Now, the Greek manuscripts and text underlying the NIV and the NASB and all the modern translations do not have these three letters here for 603 score and six. They have 666 written out. So that clue has been completely omitted in those new versions. No one would ever find out that the name of the Christ and the number of the Christ are the same, that his name he will be the Christ. He will say he is the Christ, okay? Now, there's something very interesting that I discovered. It says there, count the number of the beast. It's telling you to count. And so what I did is I counted the number of times the authorized King James Version has the name, the full name of God, okay? We'll see it has it seven times Jehovah in the Old Testament and um, 84 times the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Total, that's 91 times. And I thought to myself, I wonder if when I count the number of the beast, if in the new versions, if they have 66.6% .6 as many times. And I did it, and they do. When you look at the name Jehovah and the look at the title, the Lord Jesus Christ, they have it 60 times or 61 times, which comes out to 66.6% .6 as many times. And so I think that's a very telling thing that's happening there. Now, um, if Satan be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Satan has a kingdom. It's called in the Bible his kingdom. Okay, it is not the kingdom of God. All right. The NIV and the NASB will tell you his kingdom. They don't say the kingdom of God. Okay? And power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations. Who is this him that was given this power? It was the Antichrist. Okay? So we have he, 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 him right there. We don't have Jesus. It's gone. Okay. Daniel tells us he shall devour the whole earth. That's the Antichrist. Okay. We have he all over the NIV and the NASB. Jesus, kingdom of God, God, the Lord, they're all gone in those instances. It's he, 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 him. And those he's and him's are defined by the Bible. Now, um, the King James Bible says in Revelation 15 that he is the king of saints. In other words, one must be a born-again child of God to be under his kingship in Revelation 15. The NIV and the NASB changed that to king of nations. Okay, it's temporalizing it. It's not king of a certain group of people who are born again. It's king of nations, which is what the Antichrist will be. God shall wipe away all tears, the King James Bible says. Uh, the new versions say he. Once again, the generic is introduced into the Bible. Okay. Now, um, 
Revelation 14 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay, we are warned against his name. Unfortunately, the NIV adds a name to Revelation 14. Instead of having one name, as the King James does, his father's name written in their foreheads, these are the 144,000 Jewish witnesses, it says they have, excuse me, his name and his father's name. But the Bible tells us that his name is not the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that this is the Antichrist. So I'm suspecting that they're setting people up to take his name. Okay. Now, something strange has been happening in the NIV. When it first came out, very often it would say, the name of the Lord. Okay. And in the most recent printings, now that everyone's checked it, it's starting to say his name or the name. And they're beginning to capitalize the end. So it no longer says the name of the Lord. It's the name. Now, if you look back at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Gassner translation, for example, it talks about the name, capital N-A-N-E-M-E. -E. It's no longer the name of the Lord. It's just the name. And we read his name and his mark. Okay. Uh, the Living Bible talks about taking tattoos, Isaiah 44, 5. It says that's something that's good to do. The King James is talking about something else. It says it's subscribe with his hand unto the Lord. It just meant raising his hand to the Lord. They've got you taking tattoos. Um, you will find repeatedly in the NIV, in the most recent printings, they are beginning to capitalize the name. I believe there are dozens and dozens of places where they are starting to capitalize that name word. Okay. Now, I found this picture in a... Sunday News Supplement. And I don't know if you can all read this. It's a young lady, and they were selling a T-shirt. And the T-shirt says, One world, why can't we be friends? Living as one planet under one... What? Under one what? That was covered up, and I didn't want to go out and buy the shirt to find out what it was, but I'd read the Bible, so I knew what it was. It was under one leader, under one roller. A new world. Okay. Um, now, I found another ad in a magazine for a new AT&T card. It also says the same thing, one world, one card. So for the people who aren't reading the new Bible versions, uh, becoming indoctrinated with the concept of the one or he, um, the media is introducing this to people. Now, there are a group of Jesus seminar scholars out west. And I'll give you a quote of what they said. They said, quote, if you think you have everything in your Bible you need, we don't. Okay, they're going to add some things. Let me tell you what they're going to add. They want to first omit the book of Revelation. Now, obviously, we have all of our warnings about the, the whore of Babylon and the mark of the beast, so they've got to omit that. In its place, they want to introduce something called the Shepherd of Hermes. Now, the Shepherd of Hermes is in the Greek manuscript, Sinaiticus underlying the New International Version. So if the New International Version translators were honest, they would have translated the Book of Hermes because it is a part of their text in the Sinaiticus Manuscript. My contention is if someone doesn't know what books belong in the Bible, how can they know what words belong in the Bible? But anyway, the Book of Hermes tells us, number one, take the name. There it is, the name. Take the name of the beast. Number two, give up to the beast. Number three, form a one-world government. Four, kill those not receiving the name, not receiving the name. Kill them. Remember in Matthew it says, though time will come and they think that whosoever killeth you does God's service, okay? The book of Hermes actually tells people, kill those who won't receive the name. When they add this on to the end of the Bible, there will be people in churches reading this, thinking, oh, we're to kill those who don't receive the name, and then they'll be out after, you know, looking for Christians there. Now, um, that's one thing that they want to add, Shepherd of Hermes. The other thing that they want to start adding are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it did two very interesting things. The first was, it vindicated the book of Isaiah for King James believers, because the 20 manuscripts of the Isaiah text that were found in the um, scrolls vindicated the King James readings. 
they found absolutely no Septuagint readings. Septuagint readings are those readings you will find in the NIV and the NASB. So all 20 of the Isaiah manuscripts found in the Dead Sea Scrolls did not indicate that there had ever been anything like a Septuagint. So if anyone says to you on the radio, the Septuagint this, say prove it, you know, because it, it wasn't vindicated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But among the Dead Sea manuscripts were some apocryphal literature, the Sons of Darkness versus the Sons of Light and a number of other things. And in Gassner's translation, if you ever want to have a spine-chilling afternoon, go to the library and through interlibrary loan, order Gassner's translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it will raise the hair on your arms like nothing I've ever seen. It says, number one, that there will be a seven-year period in which those who will not receive the name again should be imprisoned. A seven-year period, it talks about that. It calls for the confiscation of personal property. And it says that there will be two messiahs, one religious and one political. Now, it's saying all this in a positive vein, okay? Now, interestingly, the Rockefeller Foundation is in charge of giving a lot of money to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Why would they want to do this? Well, obviously, if you can confiscate personal property, I think that would be to the Rockefeller Foundation's benefit. So, but at the Los Alamos Laboratories, where they created the atom bomb, you know, in the 30s and 40s, they are now digitizing the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, now why would the American government want to digitize the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, if they say confiscation of personal property, there's, there's one mark in their favor, okay? They're also working on the positive identification microchip at Los Alamos. I think it's interesting that they're doing both things um, at one place. But anyway, um, they plan to add some things to the Bible. Okay, now, we were talking about the number of his name, and uh, a friend gave me a catalog, Whole Life Products, at the top of it. You can see the 666 Mobius, okay? Um, and the Keys of Enoch, it, it says that initiates, those who are New Age initiates, should use the number sequence as frequently as possible, the number sequence 666. So you will find it emblazoned on all sorts of logos, okay? Now, um, I have a number of different uh, graduate degrees, but one of my graduate degrees is a Master of Fine Arts, and I did a lot of research in the migration of symbols, and I was invited to uh, co-teach a course on the migration of symbols at Kent State University. So this is an area where I do have uh, some special expertise, but when you trace back this 666 Mobius that you see so often, um, I've traced it back to Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a Greek teacher who went to Egypt and was initiated into the Egyptian mystery religions, and he came back and he gave us Pythagorean geometry. Okay, the man was obviously very brilliant. But he also, with his initiates, and you can read about this in Lempier's classical dictionary of proper names, but with his initiates he had a rule that we would, they would communicate using number symbols. Okay, and this is where all this started. Now, perhaps it went back much further than that to the Tower of Babel or wherever, I don't know. But I could trace it back as far as Pythagoras. But um, Alice Bailey, the theosophist, says that initiate is someone who has expressed 666. So you will see the logo of Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission being the 666 Mobius. You will see Newt Ginrich's Speaker of the House Futures uh, Research Group with the logo with a 666 on it, okay? Now, you've all seen this book that was very popular in the 80s, The Aquarian Conspiracy. Um, Aquarian simply implying that there will be an Aquarian age coming probably near the year 2000. And again, we see the 666 Mobius, these people communicating with one another, okay? Now, of all the slides, or the transparencies I'm going to be showing you tonight, I think this is probably the most important. Okay, You all have had speakers and people come in and talk about the smart card and all that sort of thing. Well, I've got the latest smart card with me, and I don't know if anyone can see this, so I made a transparency of it. But it, it's got a plastic top on it. And then the person's picture goes here, and then there's the back. Okay, now I don't know if this will... There, you can see it. Okay, it's the 666. So, when you put that six, I, I drew it a little bit darker on there because I was afraid people wouldn't be able to see. When you put it over a person's picture, you've got the 666 right on their forehead. You've got the number of the beast right on their forehead. Okay, now if you think that's frightening,
Look at that symbol and <laughs> look at the logo for the New King James Bible. Okay, it's the 666 Mobius. It's identical. Okay, this is woman, is, and her name is Mary. She was on the New King James Women's Study Edition. She's holding a Bible, and there's nothing there because there really isn't anything in the New King James that's worth reading. So. <laughs> But I want you to look at those symbols. They're absolutely identical. Okay. Now, um, let's look at a few things inside the, the New King James Bible that will show you why it's so bad. Okay. Uh, we've got the New King James omitting the name of the Lord 66 times. What an interesting number. Why didn't they stop at 65? Uh, we've got the New King James omitting the word God 51 times. That terrible archaic word God, it had to be updated. Okay. The New King James omits the word heaven 50 times. They're temporalizing the Bible, as you will see as we go along. The New King James omits the word repent a number of times. It omits the word blood 23 times omits the word hell 22 times. It has substituted the word Hades for hell, which is a transliteration of the Greek word there. Now, let me give you an example of what might happen on a Sunday morning in a New King James church. A pastor will be preaching, and he will say to a young teenager whose parent has drugged him to church, hoping that he would get saved, and he will say, now, if you do not receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will go to Hades. All right, now, that young man will go back in his mind to Saturday night when he was listening to a Styx album. And on that Styx album, which is a heavy metal rock group, they said, if you kill yourself, you will die and go to a wonderful place and party forever, and that place is called Hades. If you run the word Hades up on the Internet into the heavy metal rock satanic groups, you will find that word all through the rock music in a positive context. Hades is where you go to party forever. And so within our culture, we have a definition for hell. If you said to a young person, do you want to go to hell? They would say, no, we have a fearful notion about hell. C.S. Lewis talked about something called the philological arm of hell. Philo philologi philology <laughs> means what do words mean within a culture? Okay, hell has a powerful meaning in this culture. It's so powerful, people use it to swear. <laughs> Okay, and, But it's so archaic, they're swearing with it, but they had to take it out of the Bibles because it's so archaic and put in a word that no one knows what it means, Hades. Okay. Um, the New King James omits the word damned, damnation. Now, they're omitting God and they're omitting damned, simple words like that. Now, if you went to a nightclub, you'd probably hear both of those words, and I, so I don't think that they're archaic. Okay. They have omitted devils in the New King James Bible. Now, the New King James says that it's from the same Greek text as the King James Version, but my collation indicates 1,100 minimum places where it has uh, gone away from the traditional Greek text. And not only that, they do not use the Ben Hakim Rabbinic Bible in the Old Testament. And so I'm afraid the logo on the cover is very symptomatic of what's happening there. Now let's look at a little bit about why that logo's on the cover. Everyone knows about Constance Cumbie's book, The Hidden Ages of the Rainbow. Many, many years ago, she put that symbol on her book and included it with New Age logos, okay? And she talked about it representing the false trinity. And we're going to look at what false trinity does that represent. Um, I found a book called Mastering Witchcraft, and in that book there's a poem. And it refers to something called the unholy trinity. Now inside the New King James, when you look at this logo, it will say, that this is a symbol for the Trinity, okay? But what Trinity are they talking about? And we'll look and see what Trinity they're talking about. They're talking about, I think, the unholy Trinity of witchcraft, okay? Now, what I think they are talking about specifically is something called the Royal Arch degree in Freemasonry, okay? The Royal Arch, now listen for those words. We'll be talking about what Royal Arch means in a few minutes. Um, is a degree in Freemasonry that I believe was revitalized around the turn of the century by Aleister Crowley, who was the arch Satanist. He called himself the Beast. Okay. But in that um, initiation, three gentlemen put their toes together and formed the triangle 
within that Mobius. And then one arm goes underneath the other arm so that if you looked in an aerial view, their arms would create that logo. Uh, now, the pagans have always been doing this, okay? Found a book called The Pagan Book of Days, and we've got three people which is getting ready to do just about the same thing. And so this is, uh, you know, it isn't just something that the Masons have been doing. It's been going on for a long time. Now, this is from an old Masonic book. In that old Masonic book, we have something called the three times three. Okay, we have these three men putting their toes together. I think guys holding hands and putting their toes together isn't real good anyway. So, I mean, right away, as soon as they said do that, I'd say wrong. Okay. Um, they put their toes together, forming that triangle inside there. Can you see that? And their arms... Uh, John Ankerberg did a video exposing the Masons. And the aerial view that he shows of this is the identical Mobius on the New King James. Now, he didn't know that, or he didn't catch that, or he'll probably cut it out of the video now that I've said it. But uh, it is true, in fact. Now, um, this picture it was part of the old Masonic book. In other words, this picture is, and I've got a blow up of it, what you're looking at right here on the New King James. The only difference is they've got, the, they've got the rest of the serpent. But merely covering up the serpent, you can see that the overs and unders are identical. Now, why would they put this logo on the New King James? Why would uh, James White's anti-King James book have this logo in it? Why would the Aquarian Conspiracy be using it? Why would the Trilateral Commission be using something nearly like this? This is Richardson's Monitor, which is one of those secret Mason books, you know. And it says, question, how shall I know you to be a royal archmason? By the three times three. That's this. So by that logo, I will know that you're a royal archmason. Okay, now, this is an advertisement for CBN partners. Okay, now I blew up this little tiny thing here. I wanted to see what it was. And when I blew it up, it turned out it was an archangel of some kind inside the 666 Mobius here, this frame. And it fit right in there, identically. Okay, so I don't know if CBN is communicating with someone or they just picked a bad picture there. But um, you can see there's lots of other places. Here's a book called The Treasury of Witchcraft. They are communicating with someone. They've got this little knot here tied around the devil's tail with the same symbol. Okay. Now, the New King James um, demotes the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ all over the place. Luke chapter 13, they don't call him Lord anymore. They're simply calling him Sir. Okay. Matthew 18, 26, it says, and worshipped him, saying, Lord. They take the worship out, and they just simply say before him, saying, Master. So they're not worshipping him, and they're not saying Lord anymore. Okay. And all of the references to the Jesus Christ that I noticed or noted on there are... Now, I'm putting, I'm putting this one in just as a note of interest. I found, it, I found it interesting, and it doesn't relate at all. But as a part of this royal arch of uh, masonry, they put their hand in their chest like this. Now, remember Napoleon did this? Okay, Napoleon's motto was, to destroy, you must replace. Okay, now, someone cannot get in the pulpit on Sunday morning with a red cape and a tail and say, I hate the Bible, let's throw it out. But he can simply go in there in clerical garb with a new King James. He can simply replace it and it's gone and not a word was ever said. Okay, it reminds me of Napoleon. Now, this is a picture of Karl Marx. Why is Karl Marx doing this? Does he have a niche? I suspect there's something going on there. Okay, now, Hegel's uh, Marx and Lenin were very influenced by something called Hegel's dialectical materialism. Dialectical simply means we take one extreme and another extreme, and we make everyone sick of the extremes, and they pick the middle. For instance, communism, very extreme on one end. Uh, democracy, some would say, Marx would, very extreme on the other end. What you land up with is international socialism, which is where we are moving to today. Okay? Now, this is what they're doing with the Bibles. They will create these horrible, terrible, inclusive Bibles, the New Revised Standard, some of these extreme ones. And they'll look at those and they'll say, bad, bad, you know. And then the King James, they'll pretend that it's archaic. And then they'll try to find something like the New King James or the NIV that's right in the middle. It's, they're simply using Hegel's dialectical technique. Now, 
I just had to put this in there. You've all seen this before. But uh, just to add to that other point that I've made, we have Anne Besant of the Theosophical Society doing a very similar hand motion with um, our friend Pat Robertson. And I have no idea why they were doing that, but maybe someone can tell me. But I thought it was very, very interesting. Okay, now, as far as using that logo is concerned, uh, someone would say, well, that's a symbol for the Trinity. Remember we started out saying that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, and so we'll look at the Bible and see what does it say about logos or pictures of the Trinity. In Acts 17, 29, it says, we ought not to think the Godhead, that being the Trinity, is like anything graven by art or man's device. And so the Bible tells us no little pictures of the Trinity kids. And in art, you have um, naturalistic art, you have stylized art, which would be that serpent that we saw, and you have abstract art, which would be the logo on the New King James. So it's another form of art there. The Bible tells us not to do that. But the New King James did something interesting. They put a picture on the front of the Trinity, or their so-called Trinity, but they omitted the Trinity in the Bible, the words. They omitted the Godhead in that very verse, Acts 17. And so we are moving from a word-based culture to an image-based culture. You can see this happening with young people in, in, in able to read, in able to read the Bible, but popping in a Jesus video. So we have pictures of Jesus, but didn't he say he was the Word? The Word made flesh. Okay? In Revelation, he's called the Word of God. In fact, he identifies him so much, so much with that Word that he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. That's the A to Z. All right? And so the Roman Catholic system was able to hold medieval Europe in its clutches for 1,000 years doing two things. And those things are happening to us today. Number one, they moved from a word-based culture to an image-based culture. Take the Bibles away from people, put pictures on the walls. So that's a warning to you. The second warning is they said that only the Latin language scholars could work with the Bible, that the common man couldn't understand the Bible. And you'll hear that on the radio today so often. They'll say, well, in the Greek it says this, or in the Greek it's that, or the Hebrew. And you get to the point where you think, well, I don't really have the Bible, or they'll correct the Word of God. You lose your confidence in the Word of God, so you don't read it during the week, and then you have to go to this intermediary person who's going to tell you what it really means. Okay, so those are two things that were used during the Middle Ages to control the masses, and I believe there are two things that are moving into the church today to try to gain control of us once more. Now, I want to talk about what that royal arch was. Remember we said royal arch? Okay, um, this is the symbol that you can see inside here, but this was Hitler's logo. I don't know if you remember seeing pictures in World War II of that standard, and then the people had this on top of the standard. Well, when you look at a Led Zeppelin album, you will see that logo that Hitler had with the 666 inside, and you also see the New King James logo. Why would Led Zeppelin, the inventors of heavy metal rock group, the group that bought Aleister Crowley's mansion in England, why would they put so-called symbols for the Trinity? Well, obviously they aren't symbols for the Trinity because the Bible says don't have symbols. They are symbols for the, the unholy trinity. I, I don't know if you can see this, the thing that's spinning around up there, but that's the uh, Timothy, the Shinto symbol for the revolutions of the universe. So that's going on there. But I, I'm showing you this to tell you that Led Zeppelin has two things out there that are very interesting that will tie all this together for you. Led Zeppelin has an album called The Presence, capital P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, okay? And in that album, you know, obviously they're exalting the worship of Satan and the worship of Lucifer. Um, and in all satanic and Luciferian literature, the devil is called the Presence, capital P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Now I have found that moving into the Bible versions, where the name of God or whatever is being changed from a person, for instance in the New King James, to Presence. Now, the New Revised Standard is the very worst Bible doing this. They do it uh, half a dozen places. They're starting to take the name The Presence. Okay, now taking your uh, names for Dee from Led Zeppelin is probably not a good idea. But let's talk about who The Presence is. And we're going to see who the Royal Arch is. All right. Anne Besant, we saw her picture uh, knuckling up with uh, 
Pat Robertson there. Her book, Esoteric Christianity, is anything but Christian, of course. You know that she's a theosophist, which is really uh, one who promotes the worship of Lucifer back around the turn of the century. Now, in her book, I've taken some, page, some excerpts from that book, and I've put them with the title page. But she says, the presence, capital P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, that cheered the solitary mystic and the hunted occultist. Okay, she repeats this name num numbers of times. And I could probably bring 25 uh, New Age books up here or Luciferian books and show you that they do call the devil the presence. That's the name they use. But then they go on to say, the deities who are worshipped are, for the, for the most part, the various devils. And behind them, there is a dim but glorious overarching presence. But there's the royal arch. Okay? It's the archangel Lucifer. Okay? The presence, seldom or never named, but whispered of. All right. Now, back to the Bible versions. We have Brooke Foss Westcott, who is the man who took the traditional Greek text underlying the authorized King James Version back in 1881, and he changed it in 8,000 places omitting all of those things that you saw omitted in the NIV and the NASB. Remember it says, God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, if you didn't like Jesus Christ, you'd take that out. Or you'd find a manuscript that took that out and you'd, you'd put that in. 8,000 places this gentleman changed the Greek text. Okay, his life and letters, which was written by his son, has his life motto on the left side there. And I've moved this over here for you. But he said, he refers to to make of life one harmoni harmonious whole, you know, monism, pantheism, and anticipating the presence. So he's got that name, and he was living not exactly at Alice Bailey's time, but very much at the time of Madame Lavatsky. Okay, this is a picture of this gentleman. Okay, now, um, The uh, Theosophical Society, and we've talked about the Theosophical Society, are the perpetuators of Lucif Luciferianism for the most part. And Constance Cumby was kind enough to fax me the transactions of the first annual Congress of the Theosophical Society, which took place around 1900. And I want to read a quote to you from that. They said in around 1900, I believe it is through the churches and not through the Theosophical Society that theosophy, and we've discussed that that is the worship of Lucifer, must and should come to large bodies of people. So they said in their first proceedings that this Lucifer worship was going to come through the church. It wasn't going to come through the Theosophical Society. Now, uh, on another page in this, these uh, findings, it said, quote, the work of destructive criticism now, they're talking about textual criticism. They're talking about Westcott's Greek text because they knew Westcott and Westcott knew them. The work of destructive criticism has paved the way, sweeping away certain passages which grate on the ears. The phrase washed in the blood is one. Okay. Now, that doesn't grate on my ears. That's how I'm getting to heaven. Okay. okay so we look at the NIV today and the New American Standard Bible following the textual criticism at the turn of the century, you will see that Colossians 1.14, through his blood, has been removed. You will see in Romans chapter 3, through faith in his blood, has been turned around, switched around, washed from our sins. They have freed. Now, washed relates to the blood again. The blood which is shed, Luke chapter 22, or the cup which is poured. Now, you all are pouring cups tonight, but none of you are shedding blood, I hope. Okay, the average person, when they read that, they don't see the difference. You really need to think through what the words are saying there. Okay? Um, the King James, this is my body which is broken for you. Now, it's not only broken, but it's broken for us, for our sins. Uh, Christ suffered. Okay? That's all omitted, the blood and all that stuff that they wouldn't like, okay? Um, 
Hebrews 1, 3, by himself purged our sins. The blame is for us. He didn't die for his own sins. He died for our sins. He suffered for us. He was sacrificed for us. Okay, none of that is included in the NIV or the NASB. It simply says he was sacrificed or he suffered. You know, did he suffer for his own sins, according to these people, but not for us? Okay, so we have a different gospel there. Now, um, Henry Travers Edge was a friend of Madame Blavatsky, and he wrote a book in 1881. And he said, quote, I, the new versions have produced a rendering much more in accord with the views of a theosophist. Okay, he said this in a book called Esoteric Keys. And he is referring to the title, The Presence, in Matthew 24. All right, so we have um, one of these people saying this. Now, remember, the New King James took the blood out 23 times, and the NIV takes the blood out 41 times. So, now remember, they said it was going to happen through the churches, okay? Here is a copy of Christianity Today. I believe it's January 1996. Okay, we have a gentleman on the cover who I suspect is a Christian. His name's John Stott. He's an intellectual, but, you know, I don't know anything bad about him, so perhaps he's a Christian. However, on the back cover, now remember we said wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay, we're all looking for wolves, aren't we? It's wolves in sheep's clothing. So start looking for the sheep's clothing and then look for the wolves, okay? Uh, on the back cover of Christianity Today, is an advertisement for John Marks Templeton and his book called, Is God the Only Reality? This book is about monism, pantheism, teaching that you are God, that you are part of, part of a cell in the mind of God. I mean, it's so anti-Christian as to be unbelievable. John Marks Templeton is a promoter of Lucius Trust, which is also known as Lucifer Publishing Company, the Theosophical Society. Okay, we all know about his involvement with the Parliament of World Religions. And it's something interesting. If you got the proceedings from the Parliament of World Religions that just took place in 1993, and you look at the <coughs> list of the speakers, the speakers simply list, um, in all caps, all of the Luciferian speakers. Lower case letters for normal speakers, higher case for Luciferian speakers, okay? But he paid for that, okay? Um, I will close there, and I uh, enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. about John Marks Templeton, um, whose uh, picture and advertisement for his book was on the back of Christianity Today. Now we might wonder why would a supporter of a Luciferian organization be on the back of Christianity Today? And we mentioned that at the proceedings of the Theosophical Society, they said that it was through the churches. And we're going to be looking at some more examples of through the churches. Now, John Marks Templeton is not only involved with Lucius Trust, he is on the board of the American Bible Society. This is called infiltration, ladies and gentlemen. If you get a King James edition from the American Bible Society, you do a little collation, as I did in Romans chapter 1, 
I found that the American Bible Society had changed the King James Bible in 13 places in Romans chapter 1. The American Bible Society changing the King James Bible and putting King James on the cover. So there were changes of spelling, changes of punctuation. And so the, infiltra the infiltration is uh, very thorough. Now, something interesting about Mr. Templeton. This is a picture of his cohort. And the gentleman goes by the name of Mobius. Isn't that interesting? We just looked at what the Mobius was, that it was a symbol for the serpent, 666. Mr. Templeton's cohort is, his name is Mobius. Now, he also goes by the first name Mark. I think that's very interesting. Now, I suspect his name is really not Mark Mobius, okay? but that is what he uses, all right? Now, uh, John Marks Templeton is one of the wealthiest men in the world. He's now 84 years old. But one of his funds, his investment funds, is called the Templeton Dragon. And so it's very easy to see, um, just in a simple advertisement in a paper for the Mobius Fund, which belongs to Mr. Templeton, what is going on here. Okay. Now, the Theosophical Society that we mentioned was started by Madame Blavatsky. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a picture of her, but uh, those eyes on that woman are not the eyes of a human being. There's absolutely no question in my mind. And I wanted you to see what she looked like. There's a verse in the Old Testament that talks about someone's countenance revealing an awful lot about a person. And I think that that reveals an awful lot about that woman. But she started the Theosophical Society. And her two books, The Secret Doctrine One and The Secret Doctrine Two, are the Bibles for the New Age movement. Now, remember we said it was going to come through the churches. Okay? This was Madame Blavatsky's newspaper. The name of the newspaper was Lucifer. Nothing like being upfront with what you're all about. But um, you can see right there, it was published by H.B. Blavatsky and Ani Besant, the lady who had this symbol. Okay, now, I don't know if you can read this type, but I did want to put this up here to document what the front of her magazine says. It says, I, Jesus, right there, am the bright and morning star, Lucifer. Can you see that? I, I don't know if you can read that. You can all read that. Okay, now she's giving a reference here to 2 Peter and to Revelation 22. Now, does the Bible say that the bright morning star is Lucifer? Of course not. Okay, the King James Bible says in Isaiah 14, 12, that Lucifer is the fallen angel. He's the son of the morning. He fell and he became Satan. Okay. Now, conversely, Peter... And Revelation talk about Jesus Christ, who is the bright and morning star. There's nothing alike about them at all. Okay? But she is saying, I, Jesus, am Lucifer, the bright and morning star. Now, this is back in the late 1800s. But remember, they said they were going to come in through the churches. Okay? This was their plan. Now, if we look in the New International Version today, where it says, I, Jesus, am the bright and morning star. That's somewhat correct. The King James says, I, Jesus, am the bright and morning star there, Revelation 22, 16. Okay, 2 Peter 1, 19, the NIV says that Jesus is the morning star. And he, in the King James, he's the day star, so it's somewhat equivalent there. So they're correct in their reference to Jesus Christ there. However, in the NIV and also the NASB and other Bibles, they have omitted the name Lucifer from Isaiah 14, 12. And they have substituted the name of Jesus Christ here, Morning Star. So it says, how have you fallen from heaven, Morning Star? So if someone ran Morning Star through an NIV concordance and wanted to see who is the Morning Star, they would conclude that Jesus Christ and the fallen angel Lucifer were one and the same person. And I had a student at Kent State University ask me that very thing, and that's what propelled me into my research on this course. He said, is Isaiah 14 about Jesus Christ, as the King James Bible says? Or excuse me, is Isaiah 14 about Lucifer, as the King James Bible says, or is it about um, Jesus? And I said, well, certainly it's the fall of Lucifer. 
And he said, oh no, it's about Jesus Christ. And this young man had become very confused. And so pragmatically speaking, people are being confused by this. But this was uh, precursed by Madame Blavatsky saying, I, Jesus, am the bright and morning star Lucifer over 100 years ago. Now, if you look in the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate, and if you read it in Latin, in 2 Peter 1.19, it will say, et Lucifer Orator. When you translate that into English, it means Lucifer Rising. So the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate Bible has always said that Lucifer was Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, interesting. Lucifer, at Lucifer Orator in Latin, Lucifer Rising. Do you remember we talked about Led Zeppelin? They're coming back up again. Led Zeppelin did the soundtrack for a movie by an underground filmmaker, and his name is Anger. For those of you who are, who are uh, art majors, you may have heard of him. He's a famous underground filmmaker. The name of that film was Lucifer Rising. The English translation of the Latin Vulgate at Lucifer Orator. So they have Lucifer Rising here. So they are going so far as to substitute Lucifer here as the morning star in Second Peter. Okay. Now, um, if we look at the Hebrew text, if someone would question you and ask you, say, well, perhaps Morning Star is a, is a better rendition there. I'll just give you a little bit of a background on that. Number one, the word star is not there at all in the Hebrew text. In, the, in Isaiah scroll, in those 20 Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts, the word star, which is kokab in Hebrew, it doesn't appear at all. Now, God uses the word star in verse 13, following verse when he's talking about something else. He uses the word star, kokab. But he didn't use it in verse 12. Okay. As a matter of fact, God uses the word star approximately 36 times in the Old Testament. So God knows the word star in Hebrew, and he did not choose to call Lucifer a star. Okay. Now, if God wants to use the term morning star, for instance, he uses it in Job chapter 38, verse 7, Boker Kokab in Hebrew. He didn't use that here. So he did not want to call Jesus the morning star. Now, the word that's there in, in Hebrew is Hillel. And it's a singular masculine pronoun. And it occurs nowhere else in the Bible, just as the word Lucifer occurs nowhere else in the Bible. Now, you would find the verb form of Hillel in Job 29.3, where it says his candle shined. Okay, Hillel means shine. Okay, it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root, hell, uh, wherein the Greeks would get the word helios for sun, and the Ugartic L for God, okay? It's hell, L, sun, God, Baal, all right? Now, if you trace the word Lucifer back, L-U-C, into the Indo-European roots of that word, you will see the Indo-European word L-E-U-C, Luke, for shining, bright, white, okay? You will look at the Greek Lukos, as I mentioned, and you will look at the prehistoric West Germanic as it moves up from the Indo-European as Luktam. So when the scholars say to you, well, that came from the Latin, that isn't correct, they are lying to you because uh, etymologically that means the history of the word Lukos, Luktam, uh, the old Spanish Bible, Lucero, it's an absolutely perfect rendering of the, of the Hebrew word halal. And so someone is lying to someone when they pretend that that is not the correct translation there. Now, we went from 1881 with Madame Blavatsky. Now today at Princeton University, 1996, we have a lady named Eileen Pagels. She has written a book that has been on all of the bestsellers list. There is a move within the culture to re-educate people, to get them thinking that Lucifer is God. Her book, The Origin of Satan, says, and I'll quote, the serpent who led Adam and Eve to spiritual enlightenment is actually Christ. Let me read that again. The serpent who led Adam and Eve to, to spiritual enlightenment, well, he led them to fall. <laughs> okay. But she said to spiritual enlightenment, she's quoting someone else, um, is actually Christ. Okay, so on the bestsellers list today, 1996, Princeton University professor with her, with her hexagon, six-sided 
uh, thing that she's standing under, um, is introducing her students there at Princeton, introducing the whole culture to this notion back from the 1900s, and they all got it from the Gnostics and the Nag Hammadi um, documents. Now, I'll give you another quote from her book. It says, we give thanks and offerings and prayers to demons who have been set over the administration of the universe, and we must do so as long as we live so that they may be well disposed to us. Now, she's quoting someone else there also. However, remember in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, it says, they repented not that they should not worship devils. Now, can you imagine worshiping a devil? I mean, the idea is, is uh, horrendous to worship a devil. How do, you, how do devils become gods, though? How could a devil get worshiped? Well, he changes his name. In all of the new versions, there are no more devils. The devils are gone. They have been changed to demons. Okay, now we look in Webster's Dictionary if someone wants to find out what a demon is, and it says it's a tutelary divinity. So Webster has just told us that a demon is a divinity. And if you study the Greek religions and Plato and those gentlemen, they thought that demons were good, and Plato himself said he had a demon that floated over his head that made him a genius. Okay? Now, if you look up devil in Webster's Dictionary, it will say it's a spirit of evil. So philologically speaking, within our culture, a demon has not just a negative connotation, which it would among Christians, but among the intellectuals or the pseudo-intellectuals, it has a positive connotation. That is why they will worship devils. God knows they are devils. They will think they are worshiping demons. And here we have a Princeton University professor quoting someone saying, worship demons. Okay? Now, um, there's a new book out called The Star 2000 by Jay Gary. And the star, I'm afraid, is the wrong star. It's not the bright morning star Jesus. It's the star Lucifer. And he's looking for his appearing in the year 2000. Now in that book, he talks about uh, the joining together of all the churches. And he says, on the opening day of the assembly, that would be a united religious assembly, they, the churches, would all unite and confess of one and the same apostolic faith on the basis of years of thorough preparation, that would be the evangelicals and Christian document that you're all familiar with. They would declare the divisions between them to be a thing of the past and then join together in the celebration of the Eucharist. Now, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and Eucharist is a word that we used as a Roman Catholic. And when I was saved, I left the Roman Catholic Church, and so Eucharist is no longer a word that I use. It's actually a Latin word. But he said something else. He said, the morning star is soon to arise in every heart. Let a temple be built to Christ. Okay, now we are the temples of the Holy Spirit now. He does not dwell in temples made with hands, he said, but they want to build a temple. And you know who will sit in the temple, showing himself that he is God? Thessalonians says that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now looking at this old morals and dogma, the old Masonic book, and there's Mr. Um, Pike himself. He said, perhaps 100 years ago, the very same thing. He said, the fraternal supper of bread which nourishes and of wine which refreshes and exhilarates, symbolical of the time which is to come when all mankind will be one great harmonious brotherhood. He's connecting two things here, the unity of religions with this Eucharist, okay? Now, we will find in um, Roman Catholic circles, of which I used to be a part, that they call the host the presence of Christ. And so I think that in some way this will be the presence that we read about before. Now, that star that we looked at is the fallen star. The Satanic Bible of Anton LaVey has a picture of it on the cover. It's an inverted pentagram, okay? It's the fallen star. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ, the morning star. But it's interesting. I was looking through a Christian um, Bible catalog. And I found the Order of the Eastern Stars Bible. And I noticed that it had the same fallen star on the cover, the exact five-point satanic pentagram that is on the cover of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible. And so 
uh, as you know, the Eastern Star is the Woman's Order of Freemasonry. So it has moved right into their Bibles. Now, remember they said it was going to move into the churches. Okay. Here's a book called The Anatomy of Witchcraft. All right. And there's a quote in here. This is an extension of the rule, as above, so below. In those proceedings of the Theosophical Society that I was sent, they listed the speakers and their speeches, and one of the titles was, As Above, So Below. Almost all witchcraft and occult books use this phrase. Um, heavy metal rock groups use this phrase. This is a phrase used to conjure devils, as above, so below. It's a phrase used in black magic. Now, there's a new Bible version now called The Message by Eugene P Peterson. And in that message, in his Our Father, it says, Our Father in Heaven, reveal who you are, set the world aright, do what's best, as above, so below. So they have introduced the phrase, which for as far as I know, for hundreds of years, has been exclusively the phraseology of the New Age movement and the Luciferians. They have introduced this into their Bible. Now, Jesus said to the Pharisees, ye are of your father the devil. That's the verse in the Bible, I believe, that helped me get saved. When I was reading the Bible, and I thought, at that time before I was saved, I believed in the universal fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and I thought God was my father. When I read that, you are of your father the devil, the Lord convicted my heart that I wasn't saved, and I was, in fact, of my father the devil. Quickly got on my knees and said, I don't want to be the devil's child. I want to be the child of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got saved when I saw that verse. But there is a father who is the devil, according to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, Eli in um, Levi's Dogma and Ritual of High Magic, he talks about the Our Father, or the, the Father prayer that they use in witchcraft and magic to pray to the devil. He says that there are two ways of doing the Lord's Prayer. The Christian way, which is Our Father, which art in heaven. You know, they don't pray to the Father, which is in heaven. So they've got to take that out, which is in heaven. Okay, but deliver us from evil. Well, of course, they don't want to be delivered from evil, so they've got to take that out. Thy will be done as in heaven. Well, they're not talking about heaven at all. So on earth, that's got to come out. Okay? So around the second century, a gentleman named Marcion took those phrases out because he was of that same belief. And today, in the NIV and the NASB, we have that truncated type of our Father, where heaven is out. The dialing location when you're calling God, his zip code or, or his area code is gone. Heaven, heaven. And evil is also gone. Okay, now, um, you may wonder why is the New International Version having so many problems? Uh, part of it has to do with the translators. And I could probably go through um, any number of translators here and select some of the books that they've written and explain to you why they would agree with some of the changes in the New Bible Versions. But I've selected one, Virginia Molencott, um, because I think she's, uh, she's a very interesting person there. Um, now this, incidentally, is a, is a list that was produced by the International Bible Society, and so I, I marked her name on here, Virginia Molencon. Right. Here's a picture of her. And she said in the Episcopal Witness in um, January, June of 1991, quote, my lesbianism has always been a part of me. So Virginia Molencott is a lesbian. Now she wrote a book called Sensuous Spirituality Out from fundamentalism. Now the definition of fundamentalism is a belief in the literal meaning of the Bible. In other words, if the Bible says up, it means up. If it says down, it means down. They don't, a fundamentalist would not allegorize the Bible. They would take it literally, okay? So she is moving out from fundamentalism, all right? Now, in her book, Is the Homosexual My Neighbor, which is another one of her books, she said that the Bible does not censor homosexuality. It only censors criminal offenders. Okay, so in her NIV, it says homosexual offenders. In other words, someone who had been found guilty of a criminal act. All right, now the authorized King James Version simply says effeminate, and it comes from the root of the word meaning soft, okay, like pliable. 
that's where the word come from. It has absolutely nothing to do with the word criminal offenders. Okay, but you can see her belief as expressed in her book as the homosexual my neighbor is right there in the NIV Bible. Now, she has completely omitted, whether it's been her or another party that I'll mention later, the term sodomite in the Old Testament. So you will not find the word sodomite in the Old Testament in the NIV. In Deuteronomy Kings, because she doesn't believe that the Bible censors that sort of thing. Now, this is what she said in this book, Sensuous Spirituality, and I'll quote you. Because we are living in the enemy-occupied territory, I'm calling it a heteropatriarchy. Now, heteropatriarchy just means straight men. Okay, I'll translate that for you. Um, we must learn to subvert. Subversion means a systematic attempt to overthrow or undermine. And then she goes on another page, by working secretly within the system. Okay. Now, in this book, Sensuous Spirituality, she talks about her use of the I Ching and tarot cards. Both of these are divination and they're a form of um, uh, occultism. All right. She talks about her ongoing relationship with her mother. And most importantly, she talks about her ability to do automatic writing. Now, automatic writing is something that occultists do. And she says, quote, the words pour onto the pen very rapidly. And so I would suspect when the words were pouring onto the pen, when she was working on the NIV, they were pouring in from some sort of evil spirit kind of a person. But um, there was another person on the NIV committee. As a matter of fact, this person was one of the most important members. His name is Dr. Woodstra. Dr. Woodstra was the chairman of the Old Testament committee. He was the gentleman who in the 1950s inspired the idea at Calvin College of the NIV and he pushed it all the way through in the 60s. Now, in the January 1992 publication called The Record, which is a pro-homosexual newspaper, The Record said, quote, Woodstra was a longtime friend of the EC. The EC is the, a group called the Evangelicals Concerned. These are homosexuals who believe that it's all right to be a homosexual and to be a Christian. Okay? They said that, that Woodstra was their longtime friend and that he took the view that the Bible took, contained nothing censoring homosexuality. Well, as you can see, his Old Testament does contain nothing censoring homosexuality because it says shrine prostitutes. Now, at Kent State University, I knew a number of sodomites. Okay, I knew no shrine prostitutes. All right. Now, um, Mrs. Mullencott said something else. She went to the Presbyterian Church's USA's Goddess Worship Reimaging Conference. And you can see the woman, the picture there of the woman raising her hands in worship. And just in a few minutes, I'll show you what she was worshiping. Okay? But at that conference, Virginia Mullencott says, the monism, M-O-N-I-S-M, that's the belief that the universe is God which would mean you and I were a part of God, okay? Now, Christianity teaches that God and the universe are separate, that God created the universe, okay? But this is Hinduism that she's talking about. The monism that I'm talking about assumes that God is so all-inclusive that she is involved in every cell of those who are thoughts in her mind and embodiments of her image, okay? Now, what were they worshiping? What was that woman worshiping? They were worshiping this. And the caption underneath this in the magazine article was the heart of the beast. They were worshiping something called the heart of the beast. Now remember it says they worship the beast in the book of Revelation. Now who would want to worship the beast? You know, you can't imagine these things happening. But there's the picture of these women raising their hands and worshiping this beast. Okay. Now. When you confront the International Bible Society or the NIV people about the involvement of some of their translators, they will deny you know, everything that you can think of. And so someone corresponded with Ms. Mullencott, and she was kind enough to write back to them. And she said, quote, you are right, Baker is playing little word games. That's uh, the chairman of the International Bible Society and the NIV chairman right now, Mr. Baker or Mr. Barker, excuse me. She said he's playing word games. Then in another note she said, if you want to do me an even greater favor, you can set the record straight with the IBS. That's the, the owner of the copyright of the NIV. 
but perhaps they would rather not be disturbed by the facts. Okay, so if you call the uh, NIV, IBS out in Colorado Springs, they'll, they'll deny all of this. And we have a letter from Ms. Mullicott, and she was kind enough to respond. Uh, now, the monism that she's talking about um, is the idea that God is one. And there are some other uh, lesbian authors out there who wrote a book called Changing of the Gods. And uh, Naomi Goldberg said, God is going to change. We are going to bring an end of him. Okay? So you can see the King James does refer to God as he or him, perennially. Okay? In the NASB, in the NIV, he becomes the one. He is inclusive. In other words, he is the he, she. Uh, Ted Koppel did an um, analysis with his audience, and he said, how many people believe God is a he, how many people believe he's a he, she, and how many people don't know what they believe? 47% of his audience said that he was a he, she. 47% of the audience would agree with this he, she notion, the one. Okay. Now, who is this one? that they're worshiping. Now, one of the poems or one of the uh, phrases that the Theosophical Society has talks about someone called the coming one. And at the end of that poem it says, let death fulfill the purpose of the coming one. Okay, now they're not talking about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're talking about the death of Christians, I'm afraid. Okay, The purpose of the coming one. Now the Bible tells us who the coming one is in 2 Thessalonians, whose coming is after the working of Satan, that's the Antichrist. Okay. Unfortunately, the New King James, instead of having he, which God identifies himself with the male gender, they have the coming one in Luke 7.20. Now, another name uh, in Lucius Trust uh, literature is the mighty one, all right? another name for Lucifer. They said, come forth, O mighty one and let death fulfill the purpose of the coming one. So his name is the mighty one or the coming one. So in the NIV and the NASB, you have he, God, or the Lord God, changed to the mighty one, the mighty one, the mighty one. Now let's look and see who the mighty one is. Okay, now, um, this glossary of which words and terms says the definition for the devil is Little God, title for the Magister, as representative of one of the Mighty Ones. Diana and Lucifer of the above-mentioned witch legend are but figurative terms for the Mighty Ones. All right, I could probably give you 50 other uh, cult books that identify the devil as the Mighty One. Okay. Um, in Madame Blavatsky's book, the title, The One, capital O-N-E, is so prevalent that she has a chapter called The One. And in that book, her, her occult book called The Secret Doctrine, she says that, that the dragon is the one, Lucifer is the one, Sanit, which is really just a scramble for Satan, is the one, the serpent is the one, it goes on and on and on. Now we also see another change in the NIV. Okay, the King James talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says uh, the household of God, that's all of us who are saved, is built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, the chief corner stone. Now, when I was a professor at Kent State University for several years, I taught architecture. And a corner stone, as defined in an architectural di dictionary, is at the foundation of a building. It sets the angles for the building, okay? Now, the NIV has replaced that with a capstone, okay? A capstone is on the top of a building, all right? Now, this was taken off off the back side of a dollar. This is the great seal that was put on there by FDR. We all know about his Masonic influence. But um, Zechariah 11:17 talks about the Antichrist, and it says his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So whoever the Antichrist is only has one eye left to peer out, and there it is. All right. So we've got the capstone instead of the cornerstone in the new versions. Okay. Now. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Just don't use more than 200 words. Okay? Now, he didn't really say that. But can you imagine going into a foreign country or going to Canada or going someplace? You've used 200 words, and you've got to get copyright permission from someone to use any more. Because all of the new versions are copywritten. 
And the copyright law says that anytime you use more than 200 words, and it will say this in the front of many of these editions. In fact, I know of a number of lawsuits. Uh, the New American Standard was guilty of suing some missionaries in the Far East. They're not actually suing them, but harassing them, I should say, uh, until they would quit using more than 200 words. And so if, we've got to, if we can only use 200 words without getting permission for these new versions, uh, who are we going to go to? Okay, who has the power to give us permission to use more than 200 words? Okay, we've got a picture of Brother Bill here, <laughs> Mr. Greenspan of the uh, Federal Reserve, and Rupert Murdoch. Okay, this came, came from a national news magazine. It was either Time or Newsweek. They considered these three men the most powerful men in the world. To get permission to use more than 200 words of the NIV, we're going to have to go to this man, Rupert Murdoch. He bought the exclusive printing rights to the New International Version. Why would he do that? Why would he be interested in doing something like that? Now, Mike Royko is, is a columnist for the Chicago um, Tribune. And he referred to Rupert Murdoch as and I'm quoting here because I would never call anyone this. He called him a scumbag. And he also called him um, the Prince of Darkness. Now, there's a book out called Murdoch. It's by a gentleman named Shawcross. And it talks about Mr. Murdoch's plan to control the world. All right? And it shows some of the newspapers and some of the tabloids that he owns, and I wanted to put transparencies up, but quite frankly, they were so rude and crude and horrible that I really didn't feel that I could put them up for anyone to see. But the newspaper that he owned in England was called The Sun, and when he took that over, he turned it ten times worse than the National Mirror, and it had photos of nude women all through it and all this sort of thing. Wherever he goes, he just degrades everything, and that's why this unsaved, probably, writer for the Chicago Tribune called him the Prince of Darkness. Now, when he called him the Prince of Darkness, there may be more behind that. This is a photograph that Mr. Murdoch evidently posed for. Because, you know, when you're just walking through the office and you're in your conference room, you don't look like this. Okay, you don't have a black table with 13 chairs around it. You don't have red lights on you. You don't have your hands holding the whole globe. Okay, this picture was obviously posed. Okay, now as a Christian, would you pose behind a black table with 13 chairs holding the globe like this with red lights on you? I don't think that you would. And so there's a reason why he called him the Prince of Darkness. Every time Mr. Murdoch poses for pictures, he tries to look spooky. I think he might be spooky, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, Mr. Uh, Murdoch owns Fox Broadcasting, 20th Century Fox movies, and he's the producer of Bart Simpson. Okay, so those of you who have NIV Bibles, um, I call them the Bart Simpson Bible, because if you want permission to take 20 minutes out of a Bart Simpson segment, you've got to write to Rupert, and if you want to take more than 200 words from the NIV, you've got to write to Rupert Murdoch. Okay, now. Um, the editor of the New International Version, the chief editor, has some heretical views about how someone is saved. And so even if we could go into all the world and use an NIV, I don't think anyone would necessarily get saved easily. And here's why. This is what Edwin Palmer said, who's the chief editor of the NIV. He said, this shows the great error that's so prevalent today in some Orthodox Protestant circles. And that Namely, the air that regeneration, that's being born again, depends upon faith, and that in order to be born again, one must first accept Jesus as Savior. Now, he's calling this a great air prevalent in Orthodox Protestant circles. Well, now that isn't an air, that's the gospel, okay? But it isn't the gospel in the NIV, okay? Uh, we have another gospel there. Corinthians says, if he that cometh preacheth another gospel. Um, the King James says, children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, the new versions say, children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. Can you imagine handing a little child a Bible that said, children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. That's the last thing one would want to do because it's easy to be saved. One merely needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, okay?
So the gospel is a different gospel there. Uh, the New King James changes the gospel also. In Matthew 7, the King James says narrow is the way. Now a sliding board is narrow, but it's the easiest way to get down once you've worked yourself up that, into that bad position that we all work ourselves into, right? It's the easiest way to get down. Right? Going back down the steps is hard. You remember when you were a little kid, someone says, come back down, it's too steep, okay. Um, the, the New King James says difficult is the way. Now, it's not difficult. Narrow and difficult are not synonyms, okay? Now, you will find a trend in the new versions. In many cases, where salvation by faith believeth, believeth, faith, is changed to obedience, obey. You're not saved, then you're disobeying, okay? Uh, the King James will say we have faith. The new versions, like the New King James or the NIV, will say faithfulness. Okay, I have faith because Jesus is faithful. Okay, I am not always faithful. Now looking at uh, John chapter 6, verse 47, the King James Bible said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Jesus says, I'm the door, I am the way. Okay? The new versions simply say, He that believes has everlasting life. Believes what? Well, you can believe absolutely anything as far as they're concerned. Because it doesn't say, on me. The key, he's the door. He's the only way in. He that climbeth up another way is a thief and a robber. But here's it saying you can just climb up about 50 different ways. Okay? The gospel of Christ. And they just simply say the gospel. Okay. Um, they're presenting another doctrine here. The King James is the gospel of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, an heir of God through Christ. They're just simply gospel, doctrine, heir. Uh, the Ma Matthew 6, the kingdom of God, the spirit of God, the love of God, the angels of God, the gospel, the kingdom of God. This is all heavenly. Okay, this all relates to God. This is all spiritual. The NIV simply says kingdom, spirit, love, angels, gospel. The God is gone. Now that's not an archaic word, but they want a temporal kingdom down here. They want angels down here. Love down here, not the love of God, the spirit of God. The focus is away from God here. Okay. Now something as simple as heaven, our hope, which is heaven, is, is completely eliminated in these new versions in these verses. Our Father who is in heaven, Father which is in heaven, Father who is in heaven, Son of Man which is in heaven. They've taken the Father out of heaven. It's just Father. Okay, now they're going to take the Son out, the Son of Man which is in heaven. It's just Son of Man. They're going to take the angels out, the angels which are in heaven. They're just angels. It's not the kingdom of heaven. It's nothing. The temple is not in heaven anymore. They're going to build the temple. The masons are going to build the temple for us. It's all on earth, taking our mind off God and heaven. Okay. Now, the New King James, or excuse me, the NIV editors have a somewhat askew notion about what happens after we die. We saw that they didn't quite have heaven in there. Well, they also don't have hell. It's not black and white anymore. They've change it to the grave. Okay, now, that's what Jehovah Witnesses believe. They believe that the body simply goes into the grave. And we have a quotation here from the Jehovah Witness translation that says, hell applies to the common grave of all mankind. Now, when we look at the NIV's editor talking about this, he simply says it's to decay or perish in the grave. All right. Now, some other places in the NIV where they take hell out, they simply have death. And the Jehovah Witnesses will tell us that when a soul is dead, it's dead. You're just dead, okay? The NIV editor is going to agree with them, and it says death is simply speaking of spiritual death. The grave and death may well stand for eternal death. It's just all dead, okay? Extinction of the soul. Okay, now there's some uh, trends, and I want to go through a half a dozen trends very quickly that are happening today. Uh, Revelation 9 says, neither repented they of their fornications. Okay. The reason God has given us so many warnings in the Bible against fornication is because he loves us and he doesn't want us to be hurt and to get some serious illness. Okay. And it's not his plan for mankind. The NASB has changed, omitted the word fornication, so no wonder they didn't repent of their fornications. It's not in the Bible anymore. Okay. There is not a censor of fornication in the New Bible's versions. They simply say immorality. So I did a study at Kent State University, and I would ask college students, and I'd say, 
could you define immorality for me? And of course at Kent State they all said, well, it's the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, now, the NIV here says sexual immorality. So I would say to some young ladies, what is your definition of sexual immorality? Well, it was never, uh, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, which is the King James definition of sexual immorality, which has got a six, six foot uh, distance between people, okay? It was always some relativistic, subjective, if you're in love kind of a thing, okay? Now, if you look in Webster's Dictionary, under fornication, it simply says uh, sexual intercourse on the part of unmarried people. It's a very clear definition. So what we've moved to in the new versions are subjective, kind of elastic theologies that will fit absolutely anyone's point of view. Now, uh, the second trend is that men shall be unholy. Okay? Now, we see in the King James, it says, come take up the cross and follow me. Right, that's not very comfortable carrying a cross, is it? So they said, well, let's dump the cross. Let's just say, come follow me. All right? That would be much easier. The King James says in 1 Peter, have a pure heart. The new versions simply say, have a heart. Okay? Now, an interesting thing happened. That Greek text that I talked to you about that was created by uh, Mr. Westcott sat in the seminaries and stood pretty much the same until the 50s and the 60s. And in the 1950s and 60s, um, a number of papyri were collated. I mentioned the, to, those to you earlier today. When those papyri were collated, they found that the Greek text underlying the NIV and the NASB that did omit the word holy, did omit the word pure and all that sort of thing, that they were, those words were actually in the text. So they found that the word pure was in an ancient papyra, the, an the most ancient one they could find. So the Greek text now, underlying the NIV and the NASB, has had to go back to pure heart because they found it in this ancient papyra. So if you get a Greek Nestle's 25th, 26th, 27th edition, you will see pure heart there. But the NIV came from a 30-year-old Nestle's 23rd edition Greek text. The NAS became from a 40-year-old Nestle's 21st edition. They don't have all of those updates from the papyra. So all the time, the King James was people were carrying around the King James, and these people were saying, we have the latest scholarship. And the Lord just decided to unearth some, some of the most ancient papyra in the world, and it proved that the King James had been right all along. So now, these people are all very embarrassed, okay? But they're still not admitting that they were wrong. You will see in the King James the word perfect, 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 blameless, going all the way through here. In the other versions, you will see things like complete. Okay, now a person can complete their college degree, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're perfect. All right. Um, perfect in the King James, the new versions say mature. Okay, now a person who's 100 years old may be mature. They aren't necessarily perfect. These are quantitative words. The King James word is a qualitative word. Now, it also says another trend will be that men will be covetous, all right? So the King James says righteous in Proverbs 8 and Proverbs 21. It calls us to righteousness, being right. Okay, they have changed that to prosperity. All right, now, if people are going to be covetous, then we've got to tell them that God is going to make them prosperous, all right? Now, here's some, some very, very bad Bible translations. I would call them actually funny. The New Century Version, serving God does make us very rich. Everyday Bible, serving God makes a person very rich. The message, a devout life does bring wealth. Okay, uh, Jerusalem Bible, religion, of course, does bring large profits. New English Bible, religion does yield high di dividends. Uh, today's English version, religion does make a man very rich. Well, the, the King James Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, they're talking about godliness, and they're talking about being content with being godly, and it's a gain to you. They're not talking about any of this sort of thing at all. But the ministers that promote the New International Version may have a, a reason for doing it, because it says, contribute with generosity, <laughs> contributing liberally. Okay, the King James simply says, give with simplicity. All right, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. <clears throat> now, it says in the last days, men shall be fierce. And if you've seen a hard-heartedness uh, taking place in the Christian community today, it could be because of the verses that tell us not to be hard-hearted aren't in the, Bi the Bibles. The new versions omit, do good to them that hate you. 
They omit, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And they omit, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you. Those are all omitted. So no wonder people will be fierce in the last days. There's a heated debate in the church today about self-esteem. Okay? But it says in 2 Timothy that in the last days men would be proud. Okay? Now, Jeremiah 13 says, be not proud. All right? But when we look at the NIV, it says, be proud. <laughs> be proud. Take pride. Pride, pride, pride. It's all over the place. The King James is saying rejoicing. Okay, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, right? Okay. Now, Psalm 8, 5, the King James says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. He's talking about man. All right, we are lower than the angels. Uh, Psalm 8, 5 in the New Version says, Thou hast made him a little lower than God. Talking about us. Okay, I'm, we wouldn't be a little lower than God. I mean, we're talking, you know, a lot lower than God. <laughs> I mean, not even on the same map, all right. Now, the other thing that says in 2 Timothy 3, 4 is that men will be heady and high-minded. Now, the advertising claims of all the new versions say that they are easier to understand, all right? But my collation has shown that this is not true. For instance, the King James always uses one or two syllable Anglo-Saxon words, simple words like fan, kill, sat, go, mercy. Okay, this is the New American stand Standard, fan, winnowing fork. Kill, murder, go, be gone, bottles, wine, skins, hem, fringe, pray, beseech, called, summoned. They always use a three or four syllable word. Now, that's not just the New American Standard, that's also the New International Version. When you start counting syllables in words, and syllables are the criteria for how difficult a word is to understand. The King James will say, told. The NIV will say, conscripted, three syllables. The King James will say like. The NIV will say think it worthwhile. The King James joint. The New King James supporting ligament. Or excuse me, the NIV supporting ligament. They always use more syllables. And so uh, if you take these versions and you put them in the Fle flesh Kincaid grade level uh, analysis, you will find that the King James reads at the fifth grade, eighth month. All right? The NIV reads at the eighth grade level. The New, the New American Standard reads at the sixth grade level. Uh, the New King James at the sixth grade, ninth month. So the King James is the easiest to understand. And I've read a lot of research since I made this transparency, and the same thing keeps coming out. The King James has the smallest number of syllables per word, letters per word, words per sentence. And the King James also has something called cognitive scaffolding. One of the textbooks I wrote when I was a professor at the university was called uh, Design Process and Cognitive Behavior. In that book, I talk about how people think and how they learn. But one of the ways children learn is called cognitive scaffolding. That means if I say, the Bible, King James Bible says, uh, be careful for nothing, okay? Care is a small word that has a definition. You care about something. Full, you have a full glass of milk. So a child will put those two words and they will build them together to understand what careful means. Full of care, okay? Now, if you look at the New International Version there, it will say anxious. There is no cognitive scaffolding with the word anxious because it doesn't break down because they don't use Anglo-Saxon words. So I tried to find out why none of these versions use the simple Anglo-Saxon words and I found out that it has to do with the derivative copyright law, okay? The derivative copyright law says, quote, to be copyrightable, um, a derivative work must be different enough from the original to be regarded as a new work and must contain a substantial amount of new material. Making minor changes or additions of little substance to a pre-existing work will not qualify the work as a new version. You have to make substantial changes in the version. So here we have the new King James. It's going to pretend that it's going to update all the King James words. For the word evil, okay, now the word evil will cognitive scaffold for a child to devil, okay? But they have adversity, distressing, catastrophe, calamity, difficult, harmful, terrible, and doom. I didn't put doom on there. Fat is verdant. Okay. Man is mortal. Old is elderly. Give is gratify. House is habitation. Smell becomes savor. Okay. Why did they do this? Now, there's a book called The NIV Story by Burton Gooder, and he explains why they did it. Because they can't use the King James words. 
They're the best words, they've already been taken. So they have to go to the thesaurus. Now, if you're doing the New American Standard, you get the first choice. But then by the time you're on to the NIV, you're on the third choice. And by the time you're down to the New King James, you can't take anybody else's words, and you're using these ridiculous words like verdant for fat. Okay. But I think um, what, when people say the King James is hard to understand, they're really misrepresenting how someone understands the Bible. Uh, Psalm 25 says, the meek will he teach his way. So if someone goes to seminary, I'd suggest that se seminary 101 would be meekness 101, but I don't think that happens. Uh, Psalm 25 said, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. So I'd have trembling at the word 102, okay? Psalm 119, uh, I understand more than the ancients. So there's the understanding, the King James. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy testimonies. So obeying the word of God will open the door for us to understand the word of God. Okay, now, looking at the manuscripts that underlie the Bibles, the Greek manuscripts are made up of papyra, which I've mentioned to you, uncials, which are block capital Greek letters, cursives, which are lowercase lettered, uh, manuscripts and lectionaries, which are books that were used in churches. When you analyze all those numerically, and there are about 5,200, as I mentioned, 99% will agree with the King James Bible and all those readings. Holy Spirit, pure heart, uh, Son of God, Lord Jesus Christ, 99%. And only 1% of the manuscripts will agree with the new versions. So there, it's like a, a triangle upside down. They have a very, very faulty base. When you start analyzing the ancient versions of the Bible, for instance, if we look at English and how English uh, began to be developed with the Gothic and some of those languages, in 350, the Gothic Bible was written by Euphalus. And if you compare that with the authorized King James Version, it will match the King James. It will not match the modern versions. When you look at the Anglo-Saxon translation, which obviously we couldn't read, but in 600, it matches the King James. The Wycliffe in 1381, the Tyndale, all through the history of the church, those fuller readings, the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, are in the Bible. Now, if we look at the very most ancient versions from other languages, at the Old Latin, there are 10,000 Old Latin manuscripts. The ratio is 2 to 1, agreeing with the King James. In other words, e even within Roman Catholic manuscripts, twice as often it will agree with the King James manuscripts. When you look at the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century, the Peshitta, 3 to 1, will agree with the King James. The Gothic, the Arminian, Okay, when analysis uh, is done of the church fathers, those being the gentlemen who were writing, using Bible quotes in the second and third century, two to one, it will agree with the King James. Three to two before 400. So predominantly, the readings that the King James Bible has brought forward are the readings that the church has had. If we start looking at foreign language translations, at the German Teppel Bible, if we look at the Italian Diodati, uh, the French Olivetan, um, the Hungarian Erdosi, uh, the Polish Vesoli, uh, the Russian Holy Synodal Bible, the um, Gottes Kalsen from uh, Iceland, or the Luther German Bible, we will find that those agree exactly with the King James Bible. Okay? So foreign language translations agree with the King James Bible until 1881 when this gentleman, Westcott, changed the Greek text. The American Bible Society got hold of this Greek text, started translating foreign language editions into some of these other languages. And so if you go into any one of these countries, you will find the same thing happening today. In the Spanish Bible, there's a 1960 Rio Valera that is the corrupt Westcott and Hort Greek text. You will find also that you can buy in a bookstore the old Valera that contains the fuller readings. And so if you look in the French, you will see the Olivetan and the Segun. You will see a battle going on in every country and in every nationality of the battle for the Bible. And I believe the Bible for the English-speaking people is the authorized King James. And people often ask me, where was the Bible before the King James, as far as English-speaking people are concerned? I have a sample here from an English gospel dated in the early 12th century. Now, I'd read it for you, but I can't read it, okay? Because English before the late 1500s was really not English. It was coming up from those Indo-European roots. It contained the old Germanic. It contained a lot of Latin. It contained a lot of the old French, a lot of the Gothic, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon. And it really is not English there. We're looking again at 1382. The closest we have to the English Bible is Wycliffe's Bible. We still English-speaking people really can't read it. Now, even when we get to 1525, to Tyndale's Bible, 
We can read it. There are vestiges and phraseology that we still see in the King James Bible that are in the Tyndale Bible, but it is just beginning to become what I would call English. Now this is a typed Wycliffe Bible. And I'll give you a chance to look at some of those words. And every so often you can pick out a word that you know. But I believe when the English language coalesced and became what we know as English today, that God gave the English-speaking people a perfect Bible. And he only does things once. He does a perfect job and he doesn't have to do it again. <laughs> okay. Now, this gentleman, Westcott, that changed the Bibles, what did he say? I have a quotation out of one of his books that talks about why he changed the Bible. And this is what he said. I have a sort of craving that our text should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean a text issued by men already known for what undoubtedly will be treated as dangerous heresy will have great difficulty finding its way. He admitted that he was guilty of dangerous heresy. Now what kind of dangerous heresy was he guilty of? I'm quoting his partner on the Greek text. His partner's name was Hort. And this is what Hort said. America is a standing menace to the whole civilization. He said, I wish the American Union may be shivered to pieces. I'm quoting again from his uh, biography. My deep hatred of democracy in all its forms. Okay. Now, these gentlemen, Westcott and Hort, not only were spiritualists making contact with the dead, they were socialists or communists. And Westcott had a club called the Hermes Club. As you know, Hermes is the name of the devil. Um, he had a club, and in that club was a gentleman named Sedgwick and Frederick Myers. Okay? They had another club called the Ghostly Guild. In that club, the two Greek translators were there, along with Lightfoot, who gave us what you can buy in a Christian bookstore today as a uh, lexicon. And there's this occultist again, Henry Sedgwick. Now this group, became the Society for Psychical Research, who interviewed Madame Blavatsky, and they were favorably impressed with Madame Blavatsky. Now, can you imagine? But in this ghostly guild, the Society for Psychical Research, they were involved in all sorts of occultism. Now, Westcott and Hort had another club. Again, we see Henry Sedgwick, who was one of the arch uh, Luciferians at that time in England. Now we also see an introduction of Arthur Balfour, who became the Prime Minister of England. Okay, they were also at a club called the Uranus Club, Hort and Westcott. There again, the arch Luciferian of that time, Henry Sedgwick, Arthur Balfour, the prime minister in this club. Okay, the Synthetic Society was a club started by Arthur Balfour. And there we got Frederick Myers back again from many, many years earlier, the Westcott's Hermes Club. Okay, now Arthur Balfour started the League of Nations and the Fetal Council on Foreign Relations with Cecil Rhodes. But what we see happening here in England, because the devil doesn't know when he's going to be allowed to take over, we see the dragon in the form of a cultist like um, Sedgwick, we see the beast in the form of Balfour, the Prime Minister of England, and we see the false prophet in the form of Westcott and Hort. And so you can look at almost any country in any time and see the powers that be cavorting with these uh, Satans and these Luciferians. Okay, now today, um, this Greek text is being taken care of by this gentleman. Okay, Westcott and Hort are dead. Okay, there is a five-man team who are responsible for the Greek text today, the New International Version. And this is the man who is in charge of, of your Bible today. And if I may cover up this... <laughs> Now, the Bible talks about an evil eye, and if that man doesn't have an evil eye, I don't know who, uh, who does, but um, the Greek text underlying the New International Version is called the United Bible Societies and the Nestle's Greek Text. They have, in essence, taken Westcott's Greek text. There's Carlo Martini's name right on the front. Now, Time Magazine, when they were asked who is the man most likely to be the next pope, they chose Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini. All right. Now, Cardinal Maria Martini uh, wrote the preface to the New Jerome Biblical Commentary. So if we want to find out what does Martini believe, we can read his preface and we can read, read the New Jerome Bible Commentary. 
And in that New Jerome Bible commentary, they deny or question absolutely all the essentials of the faith, the resurrection, the ascension, the miracles, the deity of Christ. They question everything. And we have this Mr. Martini being responsible for this Greek text. So when you hear pastors on the radio or preachers on the radio, and they say the Greek says, and the Greek this, or whatever, they are talking about this corrupted Greek text um, being worked on by Cardinal Carlo Martini. Now these other gentlemen, Matthew Black, Bruce Metzger, Alan Wingren, most of them are either dead now or they are in their 80s or 90s. This gentleman is only 68 years old. He is the only person who is still volatile. And so this Greek text has fallen to his hands and Time Magazine says Martini is the man most likely to be the next Pope. Now, Martini said that he wanted to die in Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if he meant die and then raise again from the dead like it says the Antichrist will, but I don't know. But anyway, um, this is a picture of Caesar Augustus, and I think the, the likeness is not, you know, an accident. But at his Martini's Pontifical Biblical Institute, he said in his, his uh, article, The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church, he said, quote, fundamentalists were dangerous. Okay. So he believes not only you know, that uh, the basics of the Christian faith are not true, but that fundamentalists are dangerous. He also was the man who signed the mutual recognition agreement with Israel between the papacy and Israel. Now, in <clears throat> the recent document called Evangelicals and Catholics <laughs> Together, which has been signed by uh, a great number of uh, Protestant leaders. I've taken some words out of that, all right? In that, it says that initiation is required, okay? Now, Christians aren't in initiated, okay? Occultists and Masons are initiated. Christians are born again. They receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. It refers to God as the one, okay? This is from the document Evangelicals and Catholics Together. And just in case, you forget that you're supposed to be initiated, you can go to a Christian bookstore today and buy something called the Initiation Bible, okay? Um, they've got the word right on the cover there, you know, recommending that one be initiated. Now, Spangler said that Luciferic initiation is an invitation into the New Age. So this term initiation is being um, introduced to people all over the place. When we look at the new versions, um, instead of saying is saved, is baptized, are, are, are sanctified, are dead, are washed, are sanctified, are justified, are present tense, okay? They either say you have been, or you were, or you are being. Okay, now the notion there, there's a book called Catholics and Christians, and in that book it's written by a Catholic priest, and it says if a Christian were to ask you, are you saved? You tell them that you have been saved at baptism when you were an infant. You are being saved now through your good works, and you might get saved when you go to heaven. So the NIV and the NASB has no present security of salvation. I found that the young ladies at the university were very insecure about their salvation. And now I can see why, because it didn't say you are saved, it said you are being saved. And I wondered if, if they had ever, if it had ever caught on, you know. Now, you see lots of changes in the new versions that are comparable to the Roman Catholic system. For instance, Revelation 2.15 uh, says the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nico um, simply means to conquer and um, Laetan simply means laity, to conquer the people. Okay, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. God says he hates the idea of a priesthood being over people rather than the Lord Jesus Christ and his word being over people. And so uh, the new versions just say the teachings of the Nicolaitans, they take out which thing I hate, okay? Um, the King James says intruding into those things which he has not seen, all right? The New American Standard presents the exact opposite impression there, says taking his vision on, taking his stand on visions he has seen, okay? So he has seen visions, he has not seen visions. 
Now we have visions of Mary appearing in Germany now that are telling people to take a mark on their forehead. So uh, Catholics around the world will simply have a vision, something will appear to them to take a mark on your forehead. They'll look at their New American Standard and they'll say, oh, visions he's seen, well that's fine. You know. Now something very interesting happens in Revelation 17, 18, or excuse me, 17, 9 and 10. Um, the Bible talks about the mystery Babylon and it says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits period and then a new sentence starts and it says and there are seven kings okay the seven kings and the seven mountains aren't the same thing because there's a period and it says and there are seven kings okay well mystery Babylon doesn't want you to find her on the road map with the seven mountains and so Mr. Martini and the new crowd have moved the periods around changed the capitals a little bit and the new versions say the seven heads are seven, uh, the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. So it's not mountains. Mystery Babylon isn't mountains. Uh, you can't tell where it is by the uh, geography map with the city of seven hills, which is Rome. <clears throat> they changed that one. They've changed a lot of other things um, in the Bible. Uh, they omit that Jesus uh, was Mary's firstborn son because they believe that she had other sons. So <clears throat> now. Um, are we looking for a new earth where the heavens and earth shall melt with fervent heat and we're going to have a new earth or are we just looking for a new age are we going to change the page in the calendar okay the King James Bible talks about the beginning of the world and it also talks about the end of the world okay time is not cyclical in the Christian economy there was a beginning and there will be an end of this physical world okay so we always see the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. Seeing all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought ye to be? Okay? It did have a beginning. In the NIV and the NASB and also in the New King James, there is no beginning and there is no end. It's simply the age, the age, the age, the age, the age, the end of the age. Okay, so we have the New Age notion of cyclical time. A series of ages. In the year 2000, then we go into the Aquarian age and we simply change the page on our calendar. <clears throat> Not only do they teach the new age, but they actually have the word new age in them. In the Good News Bible, they actually use the word new age and they capitalize new age, okay? All through the contemporary English version, the new century, in, in uh, Matthew 19 at least, they've got the word new age or new world, or in, in Hebrews 9 10, they've got the new order. NIV, Good News, um, Amplified, New Order, all the way through there. So when the King James says at the time of Reformation, it was talking about when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the temple was rent, okay, the sacrifices aren't going to be made anymore. However, in the new versions, um, it says <clears throat> that the old order has gone, the new order has already begun. So in Hebrews 9.10 where the King James says the time of reformation, it says in the NIV the time of the new order. And I think what's going to happen there is that prophecy we have in Daniel 9 where it says uh, in the midst of the week um, shall the sacrifice and oblation cease. And then in Thessalonians it says he sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. I think the sacrifice will cease and he will sit in the temple of God. And then looking at NIV and it says until the time of the new order. And so it's not when Jesus died on the cross, it's when the new order comes in. <clears throat> okay. Now, people may say to you, um, you know, believing in the King James Bible um, is divisive, or they may say to you, <clears throat> that's usually something that's used. And I'd like to give you a couple examples of verses that might help you. The first is 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. So the idea there in Corinthians is that if everyone speaks the same thing, there is no division. So to believe that King James is the pure preserved word of God, to believe that there's just one Bible, that's the way to keep from having division. An interesting thing happens in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, talking about the people in the Old Testament, it says they did all eat the same spiritual meat, they all ate the same spiritual drink, Philippians says, walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. It's always same, 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 same. Uh, we are partakers of that one bread, okay? And so using a lot of different versions really isn't scriptural. In the Old Testament, it talks about the mouth of the prophets. 
Now, it's one mouth, numerous prophets. You will never see the plural used in the Old Testament or in the scriptures referring to the mouth. It's not mouths, it's mouth of the prophets. However, when they talk about the, the unsaved people, they use singular and plural, the mouths of the prophets. Uh, if someone tells you, well, it might not be there where you showed me, but it's somewhere else, I'd remind them of Jeremiah 26 that says, <clears throat> diminish not a word. So we're not allowed to take one word out of the Bible. Um, and I'd remind them when Jesus fed the 5,000, after it was over, he said, gather the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Now, can you imagine the creator of the universe sending everyone scurrying around in the grass to get little scraps of bread? All right, he could have made the universe in another second, okay? But if he was so concerned about those little fragments of bread, which were mere typologies of the word of God, which is our bread, he isn't going to lose one single word of the Bible. You know, the word is the light unto my path. In Luke 11, it says, having no part dark. So we wouldn't want any part of our Bible to be dark. In Philippians, it says, to write the same thing unto you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe. So if there's some repetition in the King James Bible, it's not grievous to have it repeated in there. It's safe, all right? <laughs> um, and when someone says to you, well, the Greek actually says, or something like this, I'd like to remind them that cults always move the authority away from the Bible. They'll take you to the Book of Mormon, they'll take you to Mary Baker's Eddy, Eddy's book, but they'll take you to another book. And this is what people will do, they will not believe that God has given us a pure preserved English Bible, they'll take you to a Greek lexicon. And I would remind those people that the scripture is of no private interpretation. All the lexicons disagree with one another. All right? And so that would mean that the word of God is scattered around in all the Greek dictionaries of the whole world. Now, if you study the lives of some of the gentlemen who wrote these Greek lexicons, you will find that they were, for the most part, unsaved liberals. Okay? Now, they couldn't change the law in many cases, so they changed Black's Law Dictionary. And you will find that in those lexicons, those Greek lexicons, they couldn't change the Bible, so they will sneak and sort of do a trick and they will change the Greek lexicon so that you think. But the point is to um, change the word of God. You know, God did not pro promise inaccurate translations. <clears throat> <clears throat> he promised to preserve his word. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll close right there. <laughs> Well, we have definitely heard some very important information in this. Now, what do we do with it, and how do we respond to it? Well, let me ask you this. Let's say you leave tonight. You're driving home. You pull up to the same stop sign, same stoplight you've been there before, only this time, as you push on the gas to pull, pull through the intersection, you hear the squeal of tires, your head jerks to one side. The next thing you know, your face hits the windshield, you wake up, you're at the pearly gates, and there's Jesus, and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Now, don't answer out loud and on the videotape. Mentally, how would you answer the question? Would you say, I've been a good person. Answer the question, mentally, not out loud. I haven't tried to hurt anyone. I've read the Bible. You may even say, I've taught Sunday school class. If you had answered with any of those answers, his reply would be, depart from me, for I never knew you. So what's the correct answer? How do we get our name written in the book of life? How do we get our sins washed away? How do we get into heaven? The first thing we have to realize is that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now in my life, that wasn't too hard to realize. The next thing we have to realize is we cannot earn our way. We can't put enough in the plate. We can't help enough at church. We cannot earn our way to heaven. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man, any man should boast. All right, if getting to heaven is a gift, then how do we reach out and take that gift? Uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All it's saying is it's not enough to believe it and never say it, and it's not enough to say it and not believe it. We've got to believe it in our heart, and we've got to say it with our mouth. There's one other point. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If there is no repentance, then how can we say we're saved? If there is no change in our life, then how can we say we're saved? So what does it mean when it says repent? In my life, I was walking a path, doing as I wanted to do, and realized that I had gone wrong. And I sat down in a chair and I said, God, I'll make a pact with you. I'll make a covenant. I'll make a promise. If you'll give me another chance, if you'll clean me up, if you'll wash my sins away from here on out, I'm yours. I'll follow your laws. I'll read your Bible. I'll learn what's in your King James Bible, and I'll follow it. That's repentance. Holy Spirit, I ask you to go out and knock on the hearts of those people. Whose names you'd like to write in the book of life, those people you'd like to save in the day of trouble, that they would make that decision tonight, that they would not put it off. They would not say that there's another day, there's another time, because there may, in fact, may not be, that they will make that decision tonight in Jesus' name. Let's all pray. No one looking around, let's all bow our head. Yes, you may have prayed it before. I, I pray it every day. I want the Lord to forgive my sins. Let's all say it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner, and I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father. I ask Him to come into my heart, come into my life, wash me of my sins, write my name in the book of life, keep me holy, and save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to be able to say, that's all you have to do. Now you can go on and live like the devil. But that's not what the Bible says. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. Jesus said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He wants us to follow his laws. He wants us to, to do our best to do what he asks us to do. Does that mean we're perfect? No. Does that mean we ought to try to be? Yes. It's not over in another way. Because Matthew 10, 32 and 3 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. All he's saying is he wants you to stand up and speak out to your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your bosses, co-workers, and say, yes, you're a Christian. Yes, Jesus is Lord. Now ask yourself this. If you don't have the courage to stand on your feet in front of a group of Christians at a Christian meeting and say, Jesus is Lord here, how will you say it in front of the unsaved? Pretty difficult, right? So I'll ask you this question. If you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, first time you ever asked your sins to be forgiven, first time you ever asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord, would you raise your hand? You meant business with God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you prayed that prayer...